geen enkel voorbeeld of ik zelfs te nemen eigenlijk. Ja, mijn jaar. En de Isn't it impressive? I think it's very impressive. Um, how many of you are Dutch? Quite a lot. Okay, but I'm still going to do this. So you all know the Nationale Dicté, right? <laughs> the, the National Spelling Contest. When you all walked in here, you all went very quiet, you were very hushed. And it goes to show that this is a place for attention, for paying attention to what is said, what is not being said, but implied. It's a place to listen and contemplate and ask questions. That's exactly what we're going to do today. And I'm very happy that we can do it in such a wonderful location um, because it really helps get you into the mood, I think. My name is Liekle de Vries. I call myself a blockchain realist, blockchain realist. Um, and I'm here to help you through the afternoon from one step to the next and uh, up until the final drinks and bites, which are equally important. Um, so I'm going to try and keep us all on schedule. And there are a few house rules that I will explain in a minute. Um, I'm going to talk about this location a little bit after. First things first, who of you is sitting next to somebody that they know quite well? Okay, be honest, be honest. Quite well, right? Okay, so you are going to split up and you're going to sit next to somebody you don't know quite well. It's a walk of shame, <laughs> but it's not meant as such. It's made it's meant to make sure that you are next to somebody who can actually really surprise you with some new insights or different perspectives that you might not know just yet. And it also helps build the ecosystem, obviously. So there you go. Has everybody else introduced themselves to their neighbors? Yeah? Okay, yeah? Are you comfortable? These are quite different seats. Um, can I ask, who of you are team captains? The majority, right? And who of you are challenge owners? And, well, that kind of makes it 100%. How many of you have a background in legal? Legal stuff. Just a few. How many of you have a background in tech, technology? A lot more. Any business people? Okay, some uh, design people maybe? Even those? Cool. Social sciences? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you. Um, we can still be a more diverse ecosystem, but we're getting there, and that's clearly demonstrated by these shows of hands. Um, appreciate each other for how different you can be. Appreciate, appreciate each other for how different the perspective can be. You're not required to agree with it today or tomorrow. Just I'm asking you to um, uh, take it into account. We're here to help you calibrate your ethical compass. That is just such a wonderful phrase that you could talk hours about it. Um, but it, in all practicality, it today is meant to help you consider all the possible implications of the stuff that you're about to build just a few steps further than you might have done otherwise. And we hope that this afternoon will bring you a set of questions that will help you through your development process in the hackathon and beyond. So we're not going to come up with definitive answers today. That's actually quite impossible. But we are going to come up with a set of questions that can help you, that can guide you. And we hope that in the course of this afternoon, we have triggered some part of you to subconsciously, constantly start evaluating what are the the things that we are deciding on now. How can they impact the world? And are they impacting the world for better or for worse? Whatever that may be. So, 
You've noticed there's not a lot of screens, um, there's not a lot of loud music. Your attention is your um, technology today. It is your uh, gear that you need to use. So use the pen and paper to write down whatever it is um, and listen to understand. Don't listen to come up with a counter argument per se. Listen to really understand what is being said. Uh, this was promoted, um, or the program at least was brought to you having two debates in it. But we're not going to have those modern debates in which we agree or not agree and try to make our point. We're building a dialogue here today that hopefully will continue on after uh, even the drinks and the bites. So, having said all that, we're coming back, no, we're coming back to the center of the room first, because if you're going to talk about lots of interesting and complicated stuff, it is very likely that you won't be able to remember all of it. You will just wake up tomorrow morning like, wow, that was a blast, and I really don't know where to start. So that's what these gentlemen, and they're all gentlemen, sorry about that, um, will be doing today. Ronald Mulder, who's my associate, and Karin Soutemann will be taking the uh, notes with letters, and Robert Guerin will be taking the notes in a visual way, and we'll share those results next week with you as well. So, just like in the old days when you were in college, pay attention, don't worry if you miss a little bit of, of something, it will come back to you next week. We'll take care of that. Then, let's come back to this wonderful, wonderful um, location. We're in uh, the Eerste Kamer, the Dutch Senate, um, it, ha it started out completely different, or slightly different at least, than we're using it now. Um, and we're very happy to, um, to actually have two hosts present from the Dutch Senate. Um, Ms. Pia Lokin, who will do the introductory words for you uh, just now. And uh, Mr. Alexander Renoy kan who will do some closing words to send you off into the drinks at the end of the afternoon. But first, I would like Ms. Lokin to come over here and welcome you all properly. A hand for her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to welcome you here from wherever you come from in this House of the Senate, in this room which was built between 1650 and 1655 as a meeting room for the states of Holland and West Frisia, a parliament. And nowadays, since more than 200 years, is the House of the Senate. It is the oldest parliament, uh, parliamentary meeting room from Europe. And I can add that we, the Senate of the, uh, the Kingdom of uh, Holland, the Netherlands, we were the first to use the iPad as, uh, the, uh, as our principal um, uh, mean of uh, uh, learning and reading our papers. So the papers were, went away. Um, the Senate itself is an example of how a public institution has gradually developed herself from an aristocratic bulwark for the benefit of the king into a democratic chambre de réflexion for the benefit of the people. Um, one of the reforms that the Senate has uh, developed is uh, first uh, the Senate was chosen by the king among his friends. They were senator uh, life uh, for life, and the king was meeting uh, was uh, present by the meetings with the meetings of his friends. That has changed in 1848 um, by uh, by Johann Rudolf Torbecke, and I will come and quote him. Uh, as you will see later on. From 1848 on, it's no longer the king who uh, chose uh, the, the senators, but the people of the provincial states. And until our days, 
the senators are chosen by the provincial states. We will have a new um, uh, for Kiesing, uh, election of the provincial states in March. And uh, in the end of May, the members, the new members of the provincial states, they will choose the members of the first chamber of the Senate. Um, <clears throat> over the centuries, technical inventions and developments have had great influence on the well-being of people and the shaping of states. With the invention of machines in the 19th uh, century, technical development has gained momentum, and the Industrial Revolution has resulted in a complete revision of the public tasks and functions of the state. In the 19th and 20th century, machines led to capitalistic societies as well as to communist states. In the Netherlands, the already mentioned Johan Rudolf Torbecke presented already in 1830 a treatise on the influence of machines on the composition of social and civil relations and the task of the state in it, in which he studied in particular the developments in the industrial England. He said, and I quote, it's remarkable that at the same time in which doctrine, public opinion, morals, and public institutions collaborate, as it were, to promote an even distribution of well-being, rule, and power. In the industrial sector, an order of affairs emerges which is the mother of the greatest and most screaming inequality. In the relations between state and property, the interest of many collides with the aristocracy, with the preponderance of one or few. While the terrible uprisings of the peoples against this oppression are still in memory, the French Revolution, the most exclusive privileges rises up in the industrial field, only to subject many more severely than ever to a few. This, proportion, this disproportionate and wrestling struggle between the captains of industry and the mass of workers, which has been decided to the disadvantage of the masses, may rightly be said to be one of the deepest and most dangerous wounds of the social body. A paternal government may be corresponsible. The best institutions of state may spread their wings over it, they can alleviate the suffering of it, but not heal it or take it away. It is indisputable that with the help of machines, the national income has increased. But it's not only the great quantity, it's also the method of distribution, which should be taken into account in the accumulation of national wealth. If this distribution is so unequal, that a small number of citizens have the bulk of the wealth of the state, and on the other hand, the members of an overwhelming majority earn no more than the most necessary income, then the balance is broken. I'm still quoting Torbecker. The question is not whether we approve or reject the, mar the remarkable revolution which the industrious world has undergone by the application of machines. The revolution has happened, and its effects are getting bigger. <coughs> it is of the utmost importance not to let us drift blindly and idly by the flow of these events, but to explain it with knowledge and insight from the beginning, and to remain vigilant. This gives us the authority to act when it's necessary this gives us the power to organize where we could otherwise be less than a tool. And from this, finally, policy springs forth." Unquote. This was said in 1830, nearly 200 years ago. Thanks to Torbecke, the Dutch state was politically reformed in time, so that he did not fall pray to chaos, revolution, and anarchy in the 19th century. 
The inventions and developments in the field of internet result in a new technical revolution which forces us and the states to understand the consequences of this revolution for the design of a digital public space for all citizens. When people do not have access to internet, they are already lost because without any logic, knowledge of the di digital world, people can hardly find a decent living anymore nowadays. On the other hand, organizations as Google, Facebook and so on, with their da databases and literally global connections are more powerful than ever, not only because they have become enormously rich, but also because they have the means to manipulate citizens, to make people addicted to the facilities they bring. Here too, as Torbecker said, it is not about whether we approve or reject this digital revolution. The digital revolution simply is a fact. It is up to us to understand the influence it has on citizens and on states, and this time on a global level, and to act with this knowledge and insight in such a way the achievements of the digital age will not only benefit the very few, but will be divided among all, in order that one may come to a well-ordered, balanced social existence. And that's the challenge which today has brought us here together in this beautiful house. I wish you all a deep ethical dive. In doing so, I express the hope that we will not, like Ulysses, find the angered god Poseidon, Neptune, on our path, because then our wanderings could easily take 10 years or more before we will reach our final goal. No, I wish that the goddess Athena may bring our search to a successful homecoming in the digital age in order that all people can reap the benefits of it. I thank you for your attention and for your patience. Thank you very much. Well, the analogies between then and now are just unable to be missed. Um, but still, I'd like to take a little moment to uh, focus a bit more on why, are, why we're here exactly today. So um, to do that, I'm going to invite up Rutger van Zuidam, founder of Dutch Chain, founder of the Odyssey Hackathon, and possibly the Torbecker of this era. <laughs> Rutger van Zuidam, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Just joking. Um, come stand with me. Uh, okay. yeah, yeah, this is going to be informal. Rutger, um, this is not the first edition of the hackathon, but it is the first edition of an ethical deep dive. Why did you add this to the program? As you've just learned, uh, we thought it was very important to address these topics, but actually it started, the inspiration from it started at uh, the Next Level conference we did uh, last, last year. Uh, at the Next Level conference, we look back with the ecosystem on past season, on past hackathon, what came out and what are the important topics that will take us into the next season. And the ethical questions were part of it already. Then Marlene appeared on Dutch national television uh, and she, she put a, a big flag on, on ethics and what we are doing with the internet, I think. Uh, it was a moment uh, where everybody who watched it and, and even slightly understands the internet uh, 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 had a lot of recognition with that issue. And then um, I had a conversation with, uh, with Alexander Rinoy Kahn. Um, and uh, he was uh, um, uh, a super accelerator in our first hackathon. 
So who was at the first hackathon? Some, some people here uh, as well? Yeah. So you, you all remember that. And uh, ever since we, we, we keep in touch. And uh, when we discussed um, the question, uh, actually Alexander's question of what can we do uh, about this, these big tech companies that are influencing us as uh, individuals, as societies, our economies, what can we do? And then I said, that is exactly the thing we want to discuss at the ethical deep dive we would like to organize. We were also building a partnership with the Ministry of the Interior and looking at how we can use technology for the benefit of our society is of course on their plate as well. So there was a lot of enthusiasm to, to organize an ethical deep dive. And then I asked to uh, Alexander uh, Rino Khan, uh, can, could we do it in the Dutch Senate? And he replied, I uh, don't see any reason why not. So uh, this is uh, why we are here uh, today, yeah, right? So um, I've, I've written, uh, you have some more questions probably because I have long- I, I always have questions, but are you, you have entire schemas right here. Yeah, yeah, We're not yeah, going to yeah. go through all of those no, right no, now, right? No, no, no. Okay, no. okay. Um, <laughs> um, I have another question for you, indeed. Is it actually possible to, to influence how this works? Because it's hardly possible to predict the future. This very Senate was built and, and instituted to at first serve the king, and then later on transformed, but maybe not as much, and it looks like the Googles and Facebooks nowadays are, are not even transformable anymore. So what do you think we can achieve? Hmm. Uh, it depends on how we collaborate. I think that's the key point. Uh, and it depends also on what questions uh, we dare to ask. Uh, if this or that is normal, if it's still useful, so if we look at where we are in the stories we create, we were just told a story uh, from the beginning of the industrial age uh, uh, and the industrial revolution. <clears throat> the question is, what kind of story are we in right now? Uh, what is pretty clear is that we are l leaving a story um, behind of the past century, of what worked, what used to work. What's the shortest version of that story? Hmm. The century of the self, I would say. Uh, if, if you don't know the documentary, look it up. Uh, Adam Curtis, BBC, absolutely brilliant. Four hours of uh, yeah, good stuff there. Um, it's a bit negative because we did a lot of collaboration in, the, in that century as well. But I, I, I think... Uh, also articulated uh, uh, by, by Bowie very, very eloquently is that we, we, we found out that for, for even uh, w one um, fact there are like m a multitude of truths, right? So, so, so the internet right now I think shows us that we live in fragmentation connected. So I think it's important that we, that we ask questions on how do we organize not only society itself, but I think we're now dealing also with the fabric of our society. And that's how we collaborate, how we live together, and how we have a symbiosis with all the technology that's out there, with our biosphere, so to say. So I think there's a new story emerging where we include our biospherical awareness where we include uh, uh, real connections, real relations, that when we talk about uh, identity, not just as a transaction, but also as a, as a, as a relation, uh, and that we, we take things from the absolute human point of, of view uh, in ecosystems. And uh, that's, that's, I think, what we are discovering. And uh, our credo at the, at the Odyssey is we're discovering the future by building, and we are doing that uh, together. It's not that the, some kind of institute cooks up stuff and that we just consume it. No, uh, I think that has changed. So, so we're basically moving towards uh, the century of connectedness and relationships, or relations maybe. Some, something in that direction, what we actually call this new story, we'll find out. We, we, uh, we are all 
it, I mean, it's amazing to see so many team captains here. It's amazing to see the partners here and that uh, the speakers uh, think this is important to, to, to contribute their time and that we can have actually this discussion here uh, in, in our country openly, uh, maybe even uh, fierce, fierce uh, and, and debate it. And then uh, uh, we can see how we can connect the different views and, and uh, build with that. All right. Makes sense so far, right? We're still here? Yes? Cuff, comfy seats? Yeah? Okay. So, anything else in your diagrams that you need to get off your chest before we get started? Yeah, I think, I think um, it's about the seats. It's interesting to see so many guys in love seats. <laughs> and uh, therefore, I also hope we uh, uh, find a lot more of Ath Athena on, on our way, in our story. Uh, it's uh, apparently it's uh, uh, Women's Day, uh, but I International I, Women's I, Day, even Women's Day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if we would need a day uh, for that, but I do want to celebrate all the women in tech and that uh, are entering uh, the tech space. And uh, uh, yeah, we we should uh, really welcome that. I think we do. Thank you very much, Rutger. And it is, in fact, equally balanced. We'll, we were welcomed by a female House of the Senate. We'll be sent off by a male House of the Senate. And we have two speakers, one male, one female. Um, <laughs> we'll see how far we get along the LHBTQ, et cetera, line in the coming years. But it's a start. I don't mean to mock it. It is a start. It is essential to get the diversity up, to get more equal partnerships and everything. So I'm so happy you're here today. And I wish all of you would bring more other companions next time around. But then, that's next time. For today, the ethical deep dive. Um, Rutger already kind of introduced her. Um, we'll be listening to Marlene Sticker, um, who has a long history with internet, um, currently founder and director of Waag Society, researching all sorts of stuff related to internet, but also co-founder of the Digitale Stad back when your modem still made very funny noises, uh, if you even had a modem. Um, the way we're going to listen to Marlene and talk to her is different from what you might be used to. So I'm going to explain it. I will be giving Marlene seven minutes to give an opening statement. And then we'll take some time for you to collect your thoughts and come up with questions that will help Marlene explain her story further in a second seat. And then after that one, we'll again have some time to contemplate, to talk amongst each other about what it means and come up with some more questions even before Marlene uh, rounds off with a final uh, seven minutes, uh, which might be going into the actual questions that you uh, uh, post, but it could also be her seven minutes just making her point that she wants you to really understand. And then we'll go back to these fine gentlemen in the center to see if there's anything that we can filter out that already makes sense. So I'll explain that again right when we're getting to it. But first, I'd like your uh, full and undivided attention for Marlene Sticker. I have no internal clock for seven minutes. Um, um, so I hope. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a topic to do in seven minutes. And, and more, normally, it's very strange at the moment when you bring somebody, talk about ethics, they bring in women mostly. Uh, <laughs> so this is my, uh, my excuse uh, position at the moment. Um, humans are, um, are by us. That's us. We are by us. It's because of our culture. It's because of our neural wiring. It's how our brain functions. Uh, it's in our language. Um, it's because we have interests. Uh, some, sometimes we get paid to have a certain bias. Uh, it's how our power structures are. Um, 100 years ago, I was not allowed in this space as a woman. Um, 100 years ago, women got their 
uh, voting rights in the Netherlands, the suffrage as well. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's intrinsically connected to humans to be biased. Um, technology is not growing from Earth, so it's not biological, as far as we know. It's not coming from God, it's created by humans. So technology intrinsically is bias. Technology intrinsically is culture. It's an expression of our culture. These are cultural artifacts with which we intervene in the world, we try to understand ourselves. Um, so the moment that you recognize that technology is not neutral, that technology is an expression of culture, we are not in a tech space at the moment. This is not a tech event. This is a cultural event. You are all cultural workers. So you thought you were a hardware specialist or a software specialist or you know everything about the blockchain. The blockchain in itself is a cultural artifact. It expresses an idea about sovereignty. It expresses an idea about power structures. So by, by, by being in the blockchain world, you're already part of a specific concept about power and our culture and how humans should behave and how technology should work in, in our society. So the, the basic question is, where are we optimizing for? This is also in algorithms. Where are we optimizing for? Who defines success? When is something successful? If we have to... Um, define uh, the best way to organize digital identity. Um, at the moment, if, you've, if you look up digital identity in Wikipedia, it tells us that we are the external agent to a system. So we are optimizing the system, and we have to behave according to the system. If you think about our cultural no no uh, uh, be, uh, knowledge or a way how we define our identity, it's I am the agent defining what I do in which context. So I'm both a mother and a friend and a daughter and a colleague. And in each of these contexts, I define what I will bring for my, my um, well, data or what's also being called attributes. So the moment that you define identity as optimizing for a system, you already choose a specific bias. You choose to optimize it for the owner of that system, of that, uh, of that digital identity system. So when it comes from government or from um, a Facebook or from uh, any other uh, structure, they will define the way it, has, it will be successful. So basically, the question is not, um, can we optimize for the future of humanity? It's what is actually my presumptions? What is, what is my own bias in this? It's not what you can ask from an ethical person. You can just bring in like we have a philosopher now on board and she or he will do it. It's something you have to question yourself. And I think this is why it's such an interesting space at the moment, technology space. And why it should be and could be much more open. The moment that we say it's a cultural space, more women will come in, definitely. Uh, maybe also more people from different um, cultural backgrounds could come in. So this, this position of being, um, uh, and I think, I think the biggest challenge we have at the moment is that the way that we educate technology is that when you're very smart, you're a beta, and then you understand informatics, and you know how to do this, to do this thing. And so then you exclude, with this narrative, you exclude a lot of people. The moment that you say, no, this is a cultural space where you can come in and we develop the future of humanity. We think about power. We think about uh, how to, um, to become more, uh, how, to, how to define what I can do in, in the world. Um, you're opening it up for other people. But first, you have to be more humble. To, to understand your, that you're not this, this god who knows something about technology. Um, and again, the people that are not part of the technology field, so the people that were not good at math at school, they started to believe that they're very smart, much smarter, because they will do policy stuff. And then they, other, the other people can just, just build the stuff. And this, these two narratives don't fit together anymore. So what, it doesn't, if you are not understanding the basics of technology, you don't understand how our society works. 
So you can't be naive about technology anymore. You can't say, well, the other people will do it. I will just tell, the, tell them to, to, uh, to optimize for something. No, within the technology, it's being optimized. So basically, the question is, it's not ethics as something that you can add as a flavor. It's the question for yourself, why I'm in this space, what are my cultural beliefs, and how to negotiate these ne cultural beliefs, and try to understand if you're inclusive in that process or if you're exclusive in this process. And the more inclusive this process is, the better we optimize for humanity, not just for the people that have the interest in the app or the application. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. I would invite you to, to okay. yeah. go back and sit down because otherwise you'll have to stand and listen to all the questions and that might wear you down a bit. With uh, 20 seconds to spare, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you do it. So, first up, we're going to have the remaining seconds in silence. I just contemplate what you just heard. Wow, I always find this very hard, but you seem to manage effortless, effortless, effortlessly. Um, having heard uh, Marlene talk, I can imagine she said stuff that you were like, wait a minute, what does she mean right there? So this is your chance to come up with clarifying questions. We're not yet interested in opinions. I invited you to listen to understand, so this is you thinking about, did I actually understand everything she said? And if there's one or a few things that you say I'm not so sure about, that will be your question. What do you mean, Marlene? Um, think about those questions, and then, since you're in the love seat, make it a relationship effort. Um, talk about the questions first with whoever's next to you. We'll take a few minutes for that. And if you don't have any questions, you can get to know each other even better. Um, but I would Im imagine that Marlene, having condensed such a heavy topic into only 6 minutes 40 seconds, must lead to a few questions. So, go ahead. Think about what you think needs clarification. Ik 
How are we doing? Besides getting to know each other even better, which always happens. Those who have managed to uh, formulate a question, a clarifying question, are invited to come up here and share their question with the audience. Marlene is not going to answer right away. She's going to listen to all the questions and then come up with an inclusive answer of sorts. So, if I may invite the first person that has a clarifying question to come up here to the center and approach the microphone, that'd be awesome. You are kidding me. Oh, there you go. Okay. As the first question is being voiced, I want you to listen and think about your own question. Is it doubling the one that's already been asked? Does it trigger you to formulate it even better? So I would invite you to come up with more questions. Go ahead. Speak into the microphone, please. Hi. Uh, it's actually an interruption microphone. I have to hold it on? Yep. All right. First of all, thank you for the words. Um, the last uh, point was the one that hit me most. Um, if you look at our society right now, we're relying on a lot of people to make decisions that have big impact in our society in the wave of the digital transformation wave that's coming our way. Uh, am I right in understanding that you're um, encouraging a deeper understanding of the technology and its implications on our society? for our governance layer in society. Awesome. Clarifying question. What did you mean when you said that? Did you perhaps mean this? It's up to Marlene Lickle. to come up with an answer. Lickle. Maybe yes. it's also nice if somebody asks a question, he introduces himself in like one sentence. So thank you. Neil Rutger. from Yes. Hang on, so hang much. on. I'll, I'll correct <laughs> that mistake. Tell us very quickly who you are. Hi, I'm Neil Smith. Uh, I'm looking after the blockchain ecosystem and the uh, startup environment for Yes Delft. For Yes Delft, thank you. Okay, I'll keep that in mind as well, but you've all heard it. Other questions for Marlene? Come forward, please. I don't mind if there were to form a line of questions. So again, Keep the button pressed while you're talking so that we can all hear. Okay. I will stick to the rules, and my question is about the rules. First, your introduction. My name is, my name is Oscar Person. I am uh, building a data permission platform for medical processing. And what struck me in this story is that um, we talk a lot about the intention to cooperate between entities. And uh, I think the most fundamental question is, can we find rules of cooperation that don't require understanding? Because we already have this misunderstanding between technical people and uh, people coming more from humani humanities. And is understanding actually essential to form a good cooperative environment? And as Sebastian suggested, it's actually a fundamental property of the blockchain that this understanding is not essential. It's inbuilt by the consensus mechanism. You don't need to understand how it works. It just does. So. Can we find rules for cooperation that don't require understanding? Thank you very much. If you have a question, just come up here. And if there's already somebody talking, just form a line. Keep the button pressed while you're talking. My name is Esther. No, hang on, hang on. This button. OK, my name is Esther. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, you know, everybody knows that maybe the God created human being, they, they were human being free will. Uh, 
And now we can create a machine, a robot, and we can deliver it free by blockchain technology. So my question is, should a machine of have a freedom, should, should a machine should have a rights? Listen should a machine have the same freedoms as humans have? Should a machine have rights, rights yes. like humans have? Yes, Thank if you. we create a machine Sorry, and give it you? free. Does it work? Yeah. Could you repeat the first part of, of your question? Uh, I mean, the, we, uh, nowadays we can create a machine mm -hmm. and deal with the machine freedom because we can just uh, uh, create the, the brain of the machine and let it run in the blockchain, which means nobody could stop the machine if the code keeps running and nobody can stop it, nobody, nobody can control it if we deal with it free. And in that way, should this machine have rights? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Other questions? Please come forward. Hello, and thank you for the talks. Um, I'm uh, Stefan Verhagen. Uh, I'm in the uh, uh, insurance uh, track. Um, uh, actually, we discussed with uh, Johnny. Uh, on the regional uh, differences, uh, we, we focused on privacy in this uh, case, but there are also maybe some other dimensions you can take into account. China versus Europe, America versus Europe, uh, like privacy is different in all those regions. And what is your question? Could you uh, maybe uh, give me some more dimensions to take into account? Uh, should we uh, f uh, take into account regional uh, aspects? Awesome. Thank you. Clarifying questions. One left remaining, and then we move on to the second first step. Nobody else? Your all understanding is perfect. Yes, please, come forward. You just look like Andreas Antonopoulos, right? You're not him. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Alexander Shopsky, I'm a startup uh, founder. Um, you mentioned something about that ethics can, are not, cannot be added as a flavor. Do you mean that ethics needs to be by design and by default in everything what we do? Or what do you mean by that? Thank you. Perfect question, I think. <laughs> so this is how we're doing it. One more? OK, we still have time, I think. Yeah, we do. Hello, Josh from Giveth. Um, I'm wondering how we draw equivalents uh, across different sectors when the lawyers versus the doctors, they're you know, an hour of human time perhaps, but if we're quantifying things in a granular way through fiat currency, uh, how do we get everybody on the same page to recognize equivalents between each other? Thank you. So then, this is my final offering. Last question. And don't trip over the photographer, please. <laughs> uh, hi, um, my, name, my name is uh, Martijn Schoonewille, partner at uh, Lloyd's & Louvre. Um, one thing you, which you, was quite striking is, what are we optimizing for? Uh, and uh, we can't be naive about technology. Um, I, I can fully echo that, but what should we do if people um, cannot be eloquent f for technology. Yeah, so, by nature, they, they, they need to be slightly naive for technology or they can't fully understand the technology. Um, so, then, because that links back to also what P. Alokin said earlier, uh, if we are looking for equal distribution and making sure that the machine learning, uh, that the machines can work for society, uh, how do we also ensure that those people who, who by nature, need to be slightly naive about technology, how do we need to make sure that they still benefit of it? Uh, if you can maybe elaborate on that, that would be great. So, not a small challenge, Marlene. <laughs> I go back or? Yes, please, okay. go back. And, um, it's good for your exercise, it's good for their attention to shift it from one side of the room to the other. I'm gonna give you another seven minutes 
And um, there is, ladies and gentlemen, a possibility that she will not be able to fully answer all questions, but that's okay. The simple fact that they were posed out loud helps all of us think further. So do enjoy Marlene's answers, but don't be disappointed by any of them. Well, that's a good uh, <laughs> way to start. Um, <laughs> don't be disappointed. Okay, uh, <laughs> there are seven questions, which is good, so I have one minute each. Um, I start with the last one. We are up to, what are we optimizing for? Um, as with food, we don't have to have a deep understanding how food is being produced, but we can be sure that when we go into the supermarket, there's enough regulation that we don't get dioxin in our chicken. So I don't think all citizens have to have a deep understanding of how the technology works. They have to be sure that we have regulation in place uh, that uh, keeps it in, in within our rule of law. And I think this is at the moment very much lacking at the moment. Put, putting technology from the per per perspective, per perspective of rule of law of self-determination, of um, well, privacy is being named a lot, of about sovereignty, all those kind of, this is, this has, is a whole um, um, argument in itself. So, uh, so I do agree, we should be, uh, we should not have every citizen thinking about the apps that are in there. We have to bring back trust, we have to bring back dignity into the digital. This is also what Buttarelli uh, saying from the, 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 the European, uh, officer who uh, is responsible for the GDPR, putting back dignity into the digital. The moment that we solve that issue, um, people can be naive again. But at the moment, we can't be naive. Uh, the question about uh, quantifying, I think by the whole labeling, everything which becomes data or a label or a database is defining how we perceive the world. So if we define this, if, if you have to define yourself in either homosexual, heterosexual, or what we have. We have a hetero and, and we have bi. Then we all start to identify with these three categories. But you can also describe 20 ways. You can be anti-sexual, or you can be pansexual, or you can be a lesbian butcher. This is one of the categories I've heard, which is very interesting to me, what, <laughs> what does that mean? So, but by giving 20 opportunities to identify yourself, you have a different identification with your own sexuality. So the person who defines the database, the labels, is defining how we, how we can see ourselves as well and how we organize the world. So this is an immense responsibility. And this should be something, this is a cultural debate. This is not something to fix along the side. So yes, uh, these negotiations, how do we define the world, and how do we um, quantify the world, is a cultural debate. It is a humanities debate. It's not a specific uh, a technology problem. Um, just to add to the problem, not just to solve it. Um, Ethics not a flavor, but by design, um, yes. Um, ethics by design, um, um, you have this whole princ uh, principle of uh, privacy by design. Uh, it means that in the process of technology, you have to ask the right questions and you have to involve the right people. Um, so that can be uh, who's paying for this? Um, uh, who is going to benefit from this? Um, can I understand my own bias? Did I tr with what kind of data did I train this artificial intelligence? Uh, I, this whole idea about training data, if I see, see this, this is this image of Paul Clay, where it's an, it's an angel that goes back into, this is back to the future and is blowing from the past, but it doesn't see where it's going. This to me is artificial intelligence at the moment. We, we define our future by the past. It's a very strange for concept for humanity to think about that we can predict the future by, by looking at the past. This is not how we get here. This is the, if, if we, if that, then I would never be here if that would be the way that we, we, we deal with our future. So, um, uh, yes, so, so, so it has to be in the process itself. It's not something that you can add later to it. It's really your cultural beliefs, the way that you think that how we constitute the future, if we can not predict, but how we create our futures. The regional diverse differences. Yes, of course. I mean, um, the social credits of China 
was uh, very nice. Of course, they also use blockchain, probably. So you can do all kinds of things with blockchain. You can do very, very things, very naughty things with the blockchain. Uh, <laughs> by saying that people are not allowed to, to, to use uh, the public transport because they don't have enough social credit points. Uh, there is a definitely a different approach. Uh, the Silicon Valley who believes in that the technology is God and politics is the devil. So everything that humans do is like devilish. It's not, it's not, not, not nice, it's always difficult. But technology can save us because it makes us God. This kind of, like the whole Silicon Valley rhetorics. It definitely brings us in a different space than the Chinese version, which says the state will make you work good, to be a good citizen. And I think we have a European narrative which says we, constitu we constitute ourselves by our society. So society is actually giving power to politics. To, uh, it's not totally true in our history, but it's the narrative that we build on, that we, that we identify with. So um, I think there's a, a huge challenge for Europe to come up with a next generation internet that is based on this uh, commons principles, more, more the cultural uh, uh, social, uh, social principles. Machine rights. There is non, there's, I don't believe in a narrative that, that the machines are going to be smarter than us and will rule the world because there's always somebody who, ha, who is the owner of the machine. Somebody pays the bill. Somebody is optimizing for himself. So it's not robots taking our jobs. These are companies with robots taking our jobs. The moment that you see this, this whole narrative fades away and it's only there to scare <coughs> us and not to look where it's actually happening. So all these stories about artificial intelligence is, is ruling us. <coughs> so no, machines should not have rights. Animals should have rights, maybe. Um, the, the rules, intention to cooperate, rules for cooperation. Is understanding required? No, it, we can't assume that people understand each other, and I think we can't assume that technology makes us, that it's not necessary to have this cultural exchange. Everything that, this is, this is why I'm, this is why it's more complex. We can't uh, change the complexity by saying, now we add technology. This is one of the narratives that's being used a lot. We have a problem. It's messy with humans, we bring technology in, and now it's not messy anymore because the technology will help us to understand each other. No, it takes a lot of time and effort to understand each other. This is the effort that we have to put to the table. This is, this is how to become and to create, this is humanity. This is a huge challenge, but it's also nice. I mean, this makes us human. So why should we take that away from us? So we, we have to find ways to understand each other. And we can't assume that by bringing in technology, we will, we will make it easier. We will solve this whole beautiful thing that we are, we just define it. And uh, again, uh, our neuro, neurological brain can make new connections by dialogue. We can change our opinions by dialogue. So we can't just fix it by saying, oh, we fix it now with this technology, now it will work. So I, I think this is, this is a... Um, um, it's, in, it's enriching us if we don't believe that technology solves all our problems, that we, we go beyond the idea that we have a problem bringing technology and problem w away. You know, we add problems to it. You know, it's also interesting, I'm not saying that we, again, I'm critical about technology, but I also love it, so I hope that you understand that I'm not against technology. Just, just to be very clear about your own bias in the system. And then the, the last question, deeper understanding of technology. Do we need a deeper understanding of technology to under, or do we need an, an, of technology and effect on our society? Yes, I think, I think we are only in a moment of, of starting that whole discussion, including more people in this discussion. Um, luckily, we have some very bad things happening to us, Cambridge Analytica and all that kind of stuff. We're suddenly, so suddenly politicians are awake. So first they thought social media is nice for them because they can have, they can bypass the, the mass media, they can have their own relationship to, to their voters or to, to their constituents. And now they have all these uh, troll farms inside of it and they don't know how it works anymore. So instead of, um, so I think this, 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 we have a complicated experience at the moment with the internet. As, as um, uh, Susanna Zuboff is writing in her, um, surveillance capitalism is not, you're not just a product, you're the carcass that's left 
uh, after it's been sucked from its data, <laughs> or uh, you're the elephant that's there uh, where the ivory is being taken. I think so this, this beautiful uh, worst case scenarios that are offering helps us to constitute a real debate. And, and, and have a real discussion. So I'm, I'm only very optimistic about where we are at the moment, because I think a lot of people have asked for this debate for 25 years already, <laughs> and they didn't get it, and now we have it. So I think it's a very good starting point, uh, especially also for a deep dive to, uh, to have this kind of uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. <laughs> I'm hearing never let a good crisis go to waste. Use it in your advantage. Again, a couple of seconds to contemplate on what you just heard. Clarifying questions were asked. Marlene did her best to give answers to those. And now what? What's your next thought? So by now, maybe that little machine up in your head or inside your heart or somewhere else is getting uh, going. I'd like to invite you to formulate questions that go deeper. Maybe interpret a bit. Maybe even add a little bit of opinion into your question, but still keep it open. Don't just make a point. Ask a legitimate question that Marlene can answer. Um, and again, like we did before, come up with one, discuss it with your partner in your love seat, the big love that governs this country. You're in its seat and we might even help steer the world here eventually. So have at it. What's your next question? Share them.
I'm glad to hear so much people, so many people talking. See some people still thinking. I'd be interested to hear if there's already somebody ready to pose another question. Yes, please come forward. Again, quickly introduce yourself, pose your question, and you, while you're listening, consider your own question and whether or not it doubles or maybe can be enhanced after this one. Go ahead, press the button and keep it pressed. Hello, I'm Chris and I work for GiveIt. We're a blockchain organization. Um, yeah, bringing people around causes in a transparent uh, and accountable way. And um, so my question is, so I've been working in the blockchain space for about two years now, and uh, a question that often comes up and that has been coming up here as well is like, there's almost only men. And so talking about inclusivity, what you did, is like, I find this a really difficult question and I would like to hear more about it. Do you have, do you need to have like, because yeah, like you said we would like to have more next time, I don't know, it was almost a question like bring more women, but how does that work, you know? I, I find that really interesting. Personally, I see it going beyond the, it's, it's about the individual, what the individual brings to the table. I don't see that, yeah, it's not, it's a political th correct thing of like, we need that many women, do we? Is it gonna, can we maybe just have the right person for the job, doing the job, and does that mean that we're not gonna build something that is inclusive in the future? It's a difficult thing, so. And a very interesting question, thank you. Next up, yes, from the back. Go ahead, uh, press the button and yeah. keep it pressed, this one, yeah. Yes, hello, Marlene. Uh, thanks for the uh, talk and the story. Uh, my name is uh, Hisham. I uh, built in the past 10 years a, a cybersecurity organization. And what I've seen in those 10 years is that every time when we're trying to solve a problem, we're coming up with terminology like privacy like de by design. We're coming up with ethics by design. We're, and, and I actually agree with you about the fact that we need to create a culture which enforces that. And for me, when I'm going to a company, I'm actually trying to uh, bring the culture of, of security, of privacy in my DNA, not as a feature. And if people think here that, oh, I'm coming, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear this ethics by design, I'm going to use it as, an, as a feature, that's, that's not how it works. So I'm, I'm really curious, um, and I'm working right now uh, with, with a group of enthusiasts about, in a project to design technology for the good. And how do we change that thinking, that feature-based thinking of people and think, hey, let's now do ethics by design, but really create together something that will enforce that by, just by nature? Thank you. Next up, please step forward. And again, while the questions are being voiced, consider your own and see if you can make it even better. Okay, hi, uh, Michiel Sintini, Vattenfall. Um, and I, uh, uh, well, uh, also mind crack here. Um, if you use technology and artificial intelligence, then uh, things become really uh, transparent. Also the flaw in our culture, because people are not doing what they are thinking they're doing what's good for other people in their society. How does that affect when machines take decisions and do what they think? Thank you. <laughs> Make sure not to go around in circles. Yes, please. Hi, my name is uh, Robert Rongen. I'm an independent uh, blockchain architect. Um, I would like to address a question in relation to the uh, legacy of Torbecker, which I really liked uh, the, the insight. Um, I think one of the challenges is that we um, have an ambition to change a system, but we are all part of the system. We are all working for a company or have to make a living. We, uh, but we want to change something from the inside out, but we are also part of it. And that it, it, it brings a lot of tension and a lot of... Uh, yeah, you have to be brave and you have to have a vision to step out of that system and change it. So I want to know your thoughts about that. 
but that was the opinion, right? No, the question is how, we, how, should we, how can we deal with that uh, tension? How, we, how do we deal with that tension, being in a system while... Okay, yes, please. My name is Jelle van der Ploeg, a startup founder. Um, in your opening statement, you mentioned the relationship between technology, uh, basically saying technology is a cultural artifact, and you paint a picture from um, technology being optimized for the owner of a certain system. Um, my question is kind of twofold. In uh, blockchain, you work with a sort of a decentralized system and with multiple owners, or actually the real question is who is the owner? And is there really no role of the individual in that? Thank you. I'm going to add uh, an invitation. Yes, please come forward for your next question. If by now you've also thought of someone, a book, a movie, or anything else that you think might be relevant, you can also now come up and just tell us about that little thing that you want to share with us. But first, another yeah. question. Dre Kampfraat, uh, challenge owner of inclusive banking. Um, it was a question of my member there in the first round, but how do we get this uh, informed debate since so many people, as you pointed out, are not very well aware of the real uh, issues of technology? Thank you. So, more questions are still welcome. Yes. Thank you, Martin Boonder. I'm a founder, one of the founders of Spherion, and here on behalf of the Factum Protocol. I have a question about what might be seen as a bias on the uh, statement that um, robots or artificial intelligence uh, cannot have, will always have an owner and should not have their own rights. Um, I, I think that it might be a bias of yours, <laughs> but uh, because I think that they should have uh, uh, being able to be autonomous without an owner uh, and be independent, and maybe not today, but in the future, I think that uh, they should have rights, like all animals, not only cows and sheep, uh, should have rights as well. I think these things should have uh, rights and not uh, per se uh, and be in, have an owner. That my question is, and how far is that a bias? And how far a challenge uh, if they always would have an owner? Thank you. There's two hands, yes, please. If you form cues, I'm fine. Just whoever's here first gets to ask the question first. <laughs> Just make it, make it a British cue, right? A nice, a nice line down the aisle. And don't, don't breathe down in his neck. That's not nice. Okay. I'll keep it short, uh, looking at <laughs> this. Um, my name is Martijn Bolt. I'm a freelance blockchain implementation specialist. And uh, we were pondering uh, about the idea that machines or distributed autonomous organizations should not have rights. What if we create a distributed autonomous organization that is actually a better custodian of our ethics if we compare that to humans? So that's the basic question I have. And you ask for book tips. Um, I have a book tip. I haven't read it because it arrived yesterday evening, but it is the book from Michael J. Sandel. It is called in Dutch, Niet alles is te koop. There you go. Not everything is for sale. Thank you. Next, is it going to be a question or a tip? Question. question. Please keep the button pressed. Hi, my name is Jelle Millenaar from VX Company. We do blockchain and digital identity. Um, I'm, uh, I have a question about privacy by design. Um, we often have talked about bias now. Um, and if we talk, think about the citizens, they want privacy, but do they really? That's my first question. They show that they want the products from Google and Facebook, so they <laughs> give up their privacy. And my second question is, with a digital identity, you often um, make sure that people own their own data. Uh, shouldn't we use that so they can share the data even more easy? Um, because then you actually remove the power from the corporates and make sure that you're the owner of the data and still share it. So how important is privacy there? Thank you. Is it a question or a tip? It will be a question. Okay. 
Right, my name is Luc Cabrito. Uh, I'm a student currently enrolled at Fontis Hogeschule. Um, I'm studying to become a software engineer and I have a great passion for the blockchain technology. My question is, um, you, you said the way we set up a tag or a database is biased, but the code itself isn't. Um, should a non-biased system um, be the goal or is that an ch uh, impossible chase which could go on forever? Um, can a system just be right within its own time frame? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Question. question, go ahead. My name is uh, Frank Tebiesebeek from the company Ensure. We developed a blockchain product for the healthcare. Uh, I actually got a small narrative and then a question. I watched this documentary which uh, was about prisoners in the US and about software which was um, telling prisoners if they could go on an early relief. And the software was giving certain points to the prisoners. For example, if they were having a lot of aggression in their cells, the chance on early relief was really small. And there was this one case, well, multiple cases probably, but one case of a, a black guy, and he was a really good prisoner, like uh, no aggression whatsoever. Uh, but because of, because of his skin color, um, he was rejected. And he actually managed to become a software developer in prison, <laughs> reverse engineered the system, and saw that this was a cultural thing, right? So the question is, if you're able to get there, who is allowed to change the rules of, for example, the software or smart contracts, or set the rules? Thank you. What was the Before documentary? Yeah, which documentary was that? Do you know the title? <laughs> okay, if you, if you think of it, share it on Twitter. Um, after these two gentlemen, I have room for one more question. So, run. Yes, okay. Go ahead. Question or? Question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Arnold Bevers. I'm also uh, a student enrolled at Fontes. Actually, Luke kind of incorporated my question into his. Um, yeah, we talk a lot about bias, and um, do you think it's the goal to have a, a system that has no bias in it, or do we need to have a consensus, so multiple people having the same bias does form a consensus? Thank you. It is also a nice example of how some questions are very close to each other, so stay on your toes, people. Interpret. Thank you. <laughs> One before last. Question. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Mike. I'm the co-founder of a digital identity startup, Someone, and I have a kind of personal question. Uh, so uh, you told us about ID. So we are agents for the system. Do you believe that we can become the systems, the system, um, by new concepts in the area of self-sovereign identity and so on? And especially, do you think that the authorities <coughs> will give up control? to we as, as a system. Thank you. And the final one. More of a statement, actually. I'll Check the yes, button. Yes, the button. Um, so it seems to be um, a confusion that it, whether AI can have rights. Yes, it can. Start a legal entity. It costs you 800 euros in the Netherlands to start a BV. Sign a shareholders agreement that says the company does whatever IBM Watson tells us to do when we pose a question. If the answer is ambiguous, toss a coin, bam, your AI is now a legal entity. It costs you 800 euros. Um, if you haven't read Yuval's Harari Homo Deus, do so. It answers a lot of those questions that were posed today. Can you repeat that? Uh, Yuval Noah Harari, he is a history professor from the University of Oxford. Uh, Homo sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 rules for the 21st century. Wonderful books, very simple to read. Um, he talks about equalizing power distribution in the society being a nice uh, story, a nice fantasy that is probably not going to happen. The society is diverging, stratifying. Um, 50 years from now, you will have uh, um, designer babies walking around, people, rich people probably cloning themselves. And um, around that, you will have this uh, poor society that doesn't understand what the hell is going on. So my question could be, can we use artificial intelligence and blockchain to help take care of this long tail of society that will have to deal with the impact in the future. Amazing question, thank you very much. Well, Marlene. <laughs> 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 this, 
I'm going to say it in a nicer way than I did previously, but this is the challenge for us all. So um, obviously Marlene is going to give great answers, <laughs> but it won't be done by today with only her answers. So um, first I want to thank you all for asking these questions out loud. Even if they might overlap a bit, they're important to be asked. And now over to you, Marlene, your final seven minutes. Well, I hope I made good uh, notes of all the questions. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and please, this is this is only a beginning. Uh, I, I encourage you to uh, to use this uh, whole event to, to debate it and to um, read into all the great stuff that's been there out there already. Um, uh, it's not enough to put me here and say, well, now we have a woman inside and we have somebody talked about Torbeck, so this is now, now, now this is it. So it's quite a challenge to bring more women to the table. I think, I absolutely believe that men have a feminine side, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so <coughs> digital in the sense that it's either this or that. I think we can re, uh, represent others also. If, even if I'm not a lesbian, I can speak also for lesbians. So I'm, this is, this is a, a very much the identity debate where you're talking about. And, but still, it is weird. It's not okay. It's not okay that a large part of our societies, especially in the Netherlands, is very white, very male in a certain social context. It's not, it's not okay. So everything you can do to make it more diverse and more pluriform is essential. Just, just to be for, for, maybe also for yourself. Just to have a nicer, better, more pluriform environment to work in. And uh, yeah, we can, we can make this kind of work environments better. We can uh, create better conditions uh, for people to be more invited. And, it's, and as I already said, it starts also how we educate, how we define. If, if you know, when you are in, in, in 12, 13 years old, you have to choose if you want to do informatics. And I've been there. I've been in this classroom, and it's being presented to a lot, large, a lot of girls, and they don't choose it because it's only uh, defined. They, they don't have anything about creativity. Where I think if you bring arts and purpose and tech to, uh, together, it's much more interesting. And you still can go deep if you want to go more in math or in, in hardware. Or in, in. On a daily basis in the Waag, we, we, ha we have an organization where there are a lot of women working there. And these are also women with expertise in the blockchain or in hard, uh, uh, hardware and engineering. Um, but we have an environment which is very, also very creative. And so I think it's possible. Uh, but, but again, it's, 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 it's not going to happen uh, by itself. So we have this whole maker education culture. We, we, we're trying to bring that in schools. Uh, so that you say, what am I going to, to design today? And then I need some hardware, I need also some, some software, I need design, I have ideas. So it's, it's about what we are going to create. And maybe if we change this whole idea about tech as something that we create, maybe that will help. Um, yeah. Um, actually, in, I can't really go into all the, all the questions. There, there is this whole notion that the, block, the, the whole narrative about blockchain, like, let's say it's, it's also diverting. There are more different stories behind the blockchain, but most of the whole movement comes from we don't want to have centralized power, we want to decentralize power, we want to enable people to, uh, to be somebody in their own right, more sovereign uh, identity, those kind of stuff. And then a lot of the blockchain or Bitcoin type of things, they over, oversee that they are very centralized because in the knowledge. So it's very not transparent because nobody understands it. So we have to have a huge trust in, in, in people that are building these blockchains and we have no clue. If, 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 I'm in, a regular in meetings where people talk about it and if you ask, can you explain it? They don't know how to explain it, but they are working in blockchain or they're going to apply it. So. I'm not saying that everything should be so simple, that there are complex things and sometimes you have to also, uh, we don't, as I've earlier said, not everybody has to have a deep understanding, but we also have to demystify technology and, try, and, and take the effort to under, make it understandable. And not, not saying that it's so complex you can't understand, because if you translate it into more normal terms, it is about this kind of ideas about where do we put the power and who is in charge and, and those kind of things. And then again, the, your notion about sovereignty is also your cultural notion of what is good or not is, is not good. 
you, you actually you, exp you, you, you the moment you say I'm for sovereignty or I am for a distributed um, power, those are all cultural, political expressions, which is okay. But then stand for it and be aware of it. So I'm, I would say there is no technology not bias. That's, but it's okay. Just explain where you're, what, what, what is your, uh, your, your belief. Where are you optimizing for? And it's, it's basically that question. It doesn't mean that you can't build anything anymore because it's impossible to make something which is not biased. Of course you can build stuff. Uh, but just be aware of it. And if people then tell you, well, it's quite biased in this case, in this sense, because um, the, this software doesn't... Um, um, the, the idea of sovereign identity, for example, is... Who defines that I'm a person? It's a very basic story. I mean, so I'm, when I'm born, I am a person. I don't need a state to, to, to tell me that I'm a person. Uh, but when I want to have rights, I need to have a state that tells me that I'm, that I'm a person. Everybody who works in this field, trying to define no, new ways of identity, is actually expressing their opinion about states and individuality which is a terrific good topic. Um, but then that's the debate. So don't say, don't say, I'm going to solve it. I'm saying, I'm questioning the way that we're dealing with identity at the moment, with the rights of individual people. And that discussion, everybody can join. This is not something that that's just should be solved in, 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 in a blockchain that we don't have to trust. So it is, it is actually, it is it where, most people in tech wants to solve stuff. It is actually great that you're actually creating problems. Maybe you're more in the business of creating problems than creating solutions. And maybe while identifying, saying, okay, we, we pose problems to society, um, it's, it's nice. You don't have to solve it immediately. I mean, we have 25 years, we gave the internet to the market and everybody said, well, optimize it for shareholders value. Everybody takes it for, for granted that it's free, there's no problem, people just do it, they have no clue, just let, let it go. And I think only now we started to say, no, it has to be a rule of law. We have human rights, we have uh, grondwetten, and we have to, the, these technologies, as our food, as our pharmacy, as everything that is operating in our, in our societies, should be within the rules of law. And we just have to apply them. And if we want to think that law should change, then we have that discussion that we have to have a discussion on laws. So we believe that, um, um, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't want to take the storyline just, and this is also Harari for a while, not his pa the stories about the past, but how he sort of predicts the future. Uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't bite into it. I don't, because I've, I've, it's, it's, it just takes us a wee act, bringing people to are you building on law or narrow-minded thinking? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Marlene. So there you have it. Lots more questions to be asked. Um, let's go over to our uh, county clerks, registrars. Gentlemen, would you please stand up? <laughs> because it makes for a better video shot, that's all. Um, <laughs> Um, listening to the stuff that Marlene talked about, the questions, the responses, what are the main things that come to the surface for you, Kang? Uh, the main thing is humans are messy and we should not mess with that, I think. Um, we, should, we should stay in the loop um, and we should not give machines the rights we think they might want to have, maybe because of well, the last thing about the gut microbes is very... Well, we do, we, we, do, we do know a lot, but we do also not know a lot, like how, how we are ruled, how we are governed ourselves. Um, and, but, but when you go to the technology, uh, what are we optimizing for? Um, yeah, that was one of the things we both wrote down, I think. Um, are we optimizing for humans, or are we optimizing for us, or are we optimizing for companies, or we should always think about that. Ronald, anything that struck you? Yeah, well, the, the notion that, that ethics is a conversation in the first place, it's, it's uh, asking questions 
Um, there was one question, um, should we, should we uh, aim to build a, a non-biased uh, uh, technology? Um, no, uh, that was the answer. Uh, um, just be aware of the biases. So ask questions, ask yourself questions, ask your team member questions. And the questions become more interesting when the team is more diverse, of course. Because then, well, otherwise you all give the same answers and that's not very enriching. It's kind of like the, the wisdom of crowds. If you truly have a diverse crowd, it's more interesting. Let's go over to our visual notes keeper. Uh, Robert, take us through the first stages of your uh, drawings. Yeah, but no one can see, right? <laughs> you can hold them up. You'll, you'll be see, seeing them afterwards anyways, but... Yeah, exactly. It will be on uh, display uh, later on. Um, I think what struck me the most is the, the, uh, the part of the cultural debate um, and uh, probably the, the, uh, the human measure, the uh, menstrual amount. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, um, and probably um, the set of emotions that comes with that and, and how to react on that. Yeah. And as I understand Marlene, her point is those are an equal part of the discussion. You should not throw them out. Um, we're about ready for a break. And uh, I'm guessing you're needing one right now. Um, you'll be taken well care of. I just wanted to send you off with two things. First up, I want you back here at 3 o'clock, please, so that we can pay as much attention to Aaron as we did to Marlene. And the other one is a quote from Vinay Gupta, which I came across recently. He said it a few years back already. And the quote goes something like this. If it seems weird, this new stuff, that doesn't mean that the old stuff isn't also very weird. It's just weird stuff that you've gotten used to. I think that would be a nice one to keep in the back of your minds. Thank you so much for your participation. Enjoy your break. See you at 3 o'clock.
tot het uh, een uitdaging keert. <laughs> Holy shit.
mooi dat we hier zitten zo. Ja. Hoe is het om zo in het leven te zitten? Ja, ik moest wel even zitten. Ja, dan wordt er ineens gevraagd wat je samenvatting is. Dus dan wel even... Ja, dat is een GSTC. Ja, dat is een So, welcome back. Um, yeah, we're going to find out. Um, but we need some expert to tell us, so um, I'll try and locate the expert. Um, we're going to ask one of our hosts. In the meantime, um, these are maybe not love seats, but they're relational seats anyways. So, I'd like to invite you to shift seats one more, once more. This is a second round, fresh perspectives. Go find somebody else that you're not quite familiar with and try and sit next to somebody you haven't sat next to. So do take your seats. There's no drinking or eating in here, so don't try and hide it. The concierges will find it and take it from you. So it's kind of a musical chairs without the music and without the chairs to boot, but you're managing fine. Um, please take your seats. I was asked, and maybe you were wondering as well, about these interesting objects. I've been trying to come up with my own explanation, but um, that's guessing. That doesn't work. Um, so we're going we're gonna to go to the source. Uh, one of our hosts might be able to explain this. Can you tell us, Ms. Loken, what are those objects? Sorry? Oh, those objects. They are um, inked pots, yeah? Be because before the, um, the iPad we used, we had a kroontjes pennen, <laughs> and we needed to, uh, to, to, to put our pens in the ink pot to write down our wisdoms. <laughs> so. uh, but they're closed now. They are closed, yes. We don't need them anymore. We, we have the iPad now. No problem. So just to make sure that you don't lose the lids, they're welded shut now. But they remind you of how things used to be. Again, just because the new stuff looks weird doesn't mean the old stuff isn't weird also. You've just gotten used to it. Um, and iPads do a lot more stuff than these interesting objects. Okay, so for our next round, we've paid attention to the ethical internet as a very big subject. We had huge ranging questions, which makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're 
kind of going to try to funnel it a bit, <laughs> but maybe not. We'll find out. That depends on your questions, of course. I'd like to introduce you to uh, the CTO and founding partner of Outlier Ventures, Mr. Aaron van Ammers. Again, please listen to understand and make notes of the stuff that you want to ask questions about later. All right. Is this on? Yes, yeah, on. Hello, everyone. It's not on? It is. Maybe, yeah, point upwards. There you go. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I um, work in a company, Outlier Ventures, which I uh, helped uh, found. So that is a venture, and we invest in ventures. So there's two uh, domains, actually, two perspectives where you can look at uh, the, the ethical venture. Um, the, the ethical venture, the mythical ethical venture, does it exist? Um, I don't know, but uh, let's, uh, let's all uh, find out whether, uh, whether it does. Um, what I do know, what I think, is that ethics is often not the starting point to start a business. People don't usually sit down to say, okay, I'm going to do this really ethical thing, so I'm going to found a business. Now, people usually see a business opportunity. They see an opportunity to serve customers, to make money, to uh, maybe some opportunity in the market. Um, but it's usually not the, the starting point for, that people use to set out their journey in entrepreneurship. Um, yet it is um, uh, something that can be uh, very influential, as we all see with, you know, the, the larger, more visible uh, businesses. And um, what is the ethical venture? I think it's often, uh, it's often helpful to define something in terms of its opposite because, because it's easier to see what is a non-ethical venture or what is non-ethical behavior by a venture. Um, now, of course, we have the, the, the theme of, of the day, if you will, surveillance, capitalism, the, 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 the fangs and the bats, the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera. Um, uh, Facebook being a quite notable one, um, where you know tracking you, serving you ads, even though you're not not even a member, um, even influencing people's emotions. Um, there's the, the the sharing economy or or gig economy uh, uh, networks uh, with with Uber arguably leading to um, going from the reality where taxi drivers were you know skilled uh, and trained and well paid workers now um, funneling into underpaid, uh, less skilled workers doing the same work. So what, what was the improvement? Um, um, there might be some, but there, it's easy to see the point out the bad aspects. Um, and about specific technologies, we, we spoke about, Mar Marlene uh, pointed out um, the, the bias in AI uh, and, and that, that AI can have. Um, we, there are examples of, of racist AI algorithms. There are examples of um, sexist AI algorithms. Why did they come so? Well, likely because the data that they were fed and who chose the data that they were fed with to make it um, uh, turn out that way. Um, and with, with blockchain, I think there's also, um, well, to, to further touch upon AI, does that mean that AI is racist? Well, no, I don't think so. It's, it's a technology that can be used and it can have results and we see certain results of it. Um, and with blockchain also, it's, it has you know, been, been uh, welcomed with great promise of uh, possibility to change things, to lead to more, uh, more, more equitable world and more uh, user-owned networks, etc. And we also see many negative aspects of it. We see you know, uh, the, the, the result in, in, in ransomware that can uh, fully automatically lock all your files and ask you for some, some Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency without uh, someone uh, intervening it. Uh, using it for that uh, technology or that for that purpose, and it can be used for very good um, goals, um, like you know more responsible supply chains and making sure that you know there's uh, slavery uh, will not be uh, a part of this world anymore, or um, uh, like the the food supply chain that we can be really really sure that our food is really good. So there's really you know good sides to that. Now, ultimately, um, venture to me is um, it's a way to do something that you want to see in the world and do it in a bigger way because you can do something really small. Um, you can, you know, um, you, you can help, you, you can do the things that you as a human can, can, can reach and you're only uh, limited to your, uh, your action space. But with a venture and if, you know, if done well, and if it grows well and it have, has a sustainable business model, you're able to have a larger 
um, let's say, uh, effect on the world. And with uh, the, the larger businesses as we see them on the internet right now, uh, we see also that those uh, can be positive and they can be negative effects. And now, you can wonder, had, you know, have all the founders of those businesses um, set out to, to do those things? Um, well, probably not. Maybe not, we don't know. Um, but have they happened? Yes, they, are, they have. And um, um, there's, there's steps that, that came to that. You're going to give me five minutes time, right? Because I have no... There you go. Um, so um, a bit of setting the stage. Now, one uh, additional aspect that I want to, you know, in the setting the stage I want to touch upon is uh, decentralized networks because, you know, uh, ultimately, uh, Facebook, Uber, uh, Netflix, etc. They're more or less traditional businesses still, yet they use all this modern technology. But they are, uh, you know, a, a set of limited companies and equity and, and vehicles um, with, you know, the decentralization possibilities. Things like uh, distributed autonomous organizations, things like uh, crypto networks that only exist as the consequence of some software. We go into an even uh, different domain where things can more or less exist on their own and people can influence them in a different way. Yet they also have um, yeah, a business model behind them that can result in certain positive and certain um, negative um, effects. Now, I'd really like to you know, invite you to think about um, what are some ways that, that we can do, that you can do as you set out on this journey or as you are in this journey um, to um, to make sure that um, that ethics is reflected in that business, that ethics is reflected in that venture, and that it uh, stays reflected on the longer term. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions, and then we'll uh, go to the, the second part. Thank you, Aaron. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, we've done this once before. A couple of seconds to just contemplate on what you just heard. And then after, start formulating your questions. But first, just what did he just talk about? Yes, I see people writing. Cool. Start talking about the stuff you wrote down, about the stuff that's in your mind. First up are the clarifying questions. No opinions just yet. Questions like, Aaron, you said this. What did you mean by that? Or how or what? Let's discuss those amongst each other for a bit. So it's uh, so now we're 
Let's see how we're doing. Who wants to come up with the first clarifying question for Aaron? Maybe have a little vote amongst the two of you. Which, which one of you gets to go? Is there anyone who wants to ask the first question? That always shuts a room up. <laughs> Yeah, you want to? Please lead the pack. Remember, keep the button pressed while you're talking. Which one? Oh, this one. Yeah, hi. Um, my question is. So sorry, sorry. And first, your introduction. My name is Johnny. I'm a physics student in Groningen. And I'm from Germany originally, so my Dutch is not that good. But uh, my question is um, you mentioned that you think when a venture starts, it should uh, consider ethical. Uh, um, well, arguments, but what is good ethics in that uh, context? And shouldn't shouldn't it be more the other way around? Because in my in my mind, if I just say I, my my aim is good ethics, I can define for myself what that means, and it's basically an excuse for me to do whatever I want, uh, no matter if it's demanded or not. That last part was an opinion. The first part is about how about how to go about formulating your ethics when you start a venture. Next question. Yeah. No. <laughs> You're scratching your head. Yes? <laughs> Thinking. You want to come up front? Or wasn't that a hand? OK. Wow, Aaron was very clear. Come forward, please. The two of you, form a line, form a queue. I like queues in this case. Uh, my name is Jelle van der Ploeg. Um, so in the last piece of your statement, you mentioned something about centralized businesses and, and transforming this to more autonomous networks. Um, but also those autonomous networks need some form of governance. And again, those governance models will be by human design. Even though some blockchain technologies or protocols try to incorporate this, there's always a human element in this. So I was wondering how you, how you see that, um, and if you can elaborate a bit more on that, and what should then be the, the models, governance models, that we should strive at? And looking at our Western society, at least, it's well, we pick democracy in a way, but it also comes with its downsides of, for instance, corruption. So how can we incorporate that in a, in a protocol? Thank you. Hi, Josh from Giveth again. Um, my question's largely similar to the last one, but it's uh, can we change the nature of the organization so there's not asymmetric decision making and risk applied from the top down? Interesting one. Anyone wants to add to these questions? Now's your chance. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Mike Olich uh, from Someone. <clears throat> um, you mentioned ethics come not first uh, when starting a business. Uh, in my case, it was a complete difference. Started in 2013 and got real problems about this because I was talking about ethics. I want to build something everybody benefits from. And after I've told them, yes, you can in some way do money with it. Uh, after this, um, people get interested. Before this, absolutely not. Take away this ethics bullshit. <coughs> Quote. Um, so my question is, um, has uh, Outlier Ventures ever um, invested in a project which don't have a monetary out output, but uh, benefits for the whole society? That's a straight up question there. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Evelina Drinks. Um, I'm a Jedi for the next hackathon. Um, you opened your statement with examples of what is non-ethical, like uh, surveillance, capitalism, and influencing economy. Um, and you ended your statement with uh, making sure that ethics is and stays reflected in the business. But then, what is, uh, maybe in your opinion, um, uh, ethical in the business? Thank you. Drey Kamvraat, challenge owner, inclusive banking. Um, my question is, why should you start it as a company if it's based on ethical things and not uh, make it a foundation or an NGO? Thank you. My name is Abe, I work at Odyssey. I love what you do at uh, Outlier Ventures. Uh, and my question is, is that if you invest in ethical or, or good ventures, how do you determine its value? Because in the end, you need to make a business case or a business decision. So what is the value of a good or ethical uh, venture? Thank you. Thank you. Last question. My name is uh, Frank Piesebeek from uh, Ensure. Um, also a little story. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg um, was asked during a hearing if he would like that Facebook knew where he slept last night. Do you think uh, ethics will still get enough attention when you've grown exponentially like Facebook? Well, Aaron, there you go. Making his final notes. Trying to come up with answers. And well, you know, he only has seven minutes, so it's not his fault. Can I invite you up here, Aaron? Again, try and listen to understand. In the next round, maybe add some more deepening questions or some follow-ups. But first, let's hear what Aaron has to say. All right. Um, there were some themes, thankfully, in the, the big range of questions that I got, so I'll uh, touch upon those first. Um, on, um, on profitability, I think that's an interesting one. Um, uh, to, to answer the straight-up question, has Outlaw Ventures ever invested in something that did not have any uh, 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 profits or business model? No, we have not. Um, and um, to, uh, to to touch upon the wider subject and what I, well, maybe I personally more see as, as the, the, the threat there. Um, I believe that it's possible to have something that's ethical and profitable. And I think um, that allows for uh, that ethical thing, that good thing, to be uh, bigger and to grow bigger than it would without being profitable. Um, however, it is definitely a challenge to, uh, to realize that. Um, why start um, start a business and not an NGO? Um, you could start an NGO, and you could also have you know great success with that. And they're you know they're great NGOs doing great things. However, I think that a, a business is also a way to uh, to reach something. Um, um, there's um, well, one example is not an outlier investment, but it's uh, maybe good to mention it for that way. Um, this company called Choose with three O's. They do uh, uh, something in the in the carbon offsetting. Um, uh, let's say, uh, climate neutral, even climate positive um, sphere, um, where they allow you to uh, buy into carbon credits and then fund um, um, uh, sustainable uh, energy, sustainable projects with that. Um, I would argue that if they would do that purely as an NGO, um, it would be probably less appealing for consumers and businesses to to support their efforts, because now they, with the way they present it is more that it's, it becomes an interesting project. It becomes fun to support the climate, um, uh, or yeah, to at least yeah, to try and repair the climate. Um, so I, why would you do it? Well, I think it's, it's always a choice. You can always start an NGO, but I think reasons to do it would be that uh, it allows for um, hopefully a, a sustainable and economically sustainable way to realize that, that goal that you think is good. And what is good ethics? Well, ultimately, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, and um, uh, ultimately, I think it's also a case of um, bringing in 
um, choosing the people that you bring into your journey. Um, because as a person, um, you, can you can only go so far. You, you, what is an ethical person? Is there an ethical person? Well, I think there are people that behave ethically um, often, and then still whether they behave ethically is in the eye of the beholder. But um, uh, ultimately, you can only go so far. And bringing other people in, in, like the first, your first hire, your second hire, um, the, the 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 code of conduct that you might set for your business, that uh, that sort of ratifies and um, um, sets in yeah more more uh, long term ways what what you think that your business should be about. And to touch upon diversity, there was someone who asked, um, it's not a question for me, but I think it's apt here. Um, should um, should we in tech? Should we deliberately? try to attract uh, more women because there are less women there uh, in, our, in our space. Uh, my answer is a firm yes. Why is it a firm yes? Not, you know, not to, to me, uh, just meet some, some quotum, um, but to ensure that we have different voices. And um, that's not only uh, women, it's just like when you look at a group and you see all, uh, or well, the vast majority wi white males between 30 and 40 years old, um, there's, there's something unnatural about that, and, and it's going to have a, a, a strong bias. Um, so having more voices, not only from different genders, but from different backgrounds and from different ge ge geographical areas, I think that um, will lead to uh, um, yeah, a more uh, well-informed uh, view of what, what, a, what a business can do. Um, uh, scaling ethics, um, that's a very interesting one, like how Indeed, do you, can you make sure that uh, that that eth the thing that you hope to ingrain some some ethics in, and that, that that is a good thing? How can you make sure that it still does a good thing when it grows as big as 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 Google or Facebook? And um, interesting uh, uh, example there is that Google uh, initially had this this sentence: "Don't be evil" in their code of conduct or whatever it was. Um, then people were misinformed that it was taken out. It was not taken out. It was moved to the all the way to the end of the alphabet uh, um, code of conduct or whatever, it's still there. But I mean, arguably you can say that that's, Google does some things that uh, are not entirely good or that may be, even be in, in the eyes of some, uh, some people be, uh, be evil. Well, I think um, no, um, writing these things down and making people aware of them more than just, well, we have it there. What is, what is you know, what are, what are our morals? Well, they're there in the cabinet. Um, you know, ma making them more something of the day-to-day. -day. Um, I think that that's one way to do it. Um, no, it's one, one tool that can help. Um, and uh, another, I think, is to be really um, critical about uh, economic models. Because ultimately, um, why does uh, the vast majority of internet businesses currently um, sell your data or sell you as a product or whatever? Because that's what makes money. It makes the vast uh, majority of, of money. Um, so we can, we can think about it and we can think about what, what, what do we want, how do we want to um, design these systems so that um, more ethical things make money. It's, it's, I don't have the answers here, but it's, you know, uh, it's at least important to, to think about these things. And finally, about governance. Um, um, recently, um, another partner in our business, Lawrence Lundy, uh, Brian, he wrote a, a post about um, governance in decentralized systems or the lack of the possibility thereof. And he, he pledged for uh, the need for a, a trias politica in crypto networks. So in these open decentralized networks, do we need more than just um, the, um, basically the executive um, power, because that's, that's sort of the reality of what you see there. The people who execute, the people who build the code, the people who design these systems, they effectively rule. The, the, the developers of Ethereum, the developers of Bitcoin, the developers of these networks, they are the ones effectively ruling, and there are no um, real uh, uh, legal laws that, that people write down, and there's not, not really a judiciary power, um, and there's a combination of technology and of um, organizational and human factors that um, yeah, should be created and built around those to have a balance between what is purely a decentralized way out there thing and what are the people that interact um, with that thing. Um, so I'll leave it with that for, uh, for this one. Thank you, Aaron.
So even though we're focusing on a very practical application of all these ethical questions, it is still quite challenging. Take another 20 seconds to think about the answers that Aaron just gave. And like before, now is the time to come up with questions that go deeper. If all is well, you kind of understand what Arne is on about, so now we're digging deeper. How about this? How about that? Formulate your questions and um, first up, discuss amongst each other. We have somebody already very eager to ask his first question, but I want to have to have you first talk to each other about this. Discuss your questions amongst each other and come up with the best version of that question before you come up here. See if you can come up with the first version of that very question. And then listen to the ones that will be asked and see if your question doubles that. or not, we're going to start with the next series of questions because we have one very eager participant chomping at the bit. So please divert your attention to the center of the room, including Aaron, please. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's hear it for the first question. You have to press the button and keep it pressed. Oh, hi, um, my name is Tim, I'm in the blockchain space for over four years, and um, in your talk, uh, Aaron mentioned uh, that Google had in their uh, code of conduct, don't uh, behave evil, and about behaving ethically, but what exactly does it mean to behave, behave ethically, because what we think is ethical is different among different cultures around the globe. For instance, in Europe, we think that there is nothing more valuable than a human life. But if you go to China, they would look at you, of course, there are more important things than human life. And even if and, and even if you look at the consequences, if, if human life is most important, you generally end up with, 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 with the environmental disasters we have right now. Because, OK, that's a little bit opinion. But if you look at it, it's because we are basically with too many. So what, what exactly is behaving ethical? It's, it's not really an exact science. So I, I don't really know what behaving ethical means. And also I don't know what 
evil means, because what is evil is also different. Um, uh, 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 two people can have a completely different view about what is evil and what is not evil. So that's my question. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> opinion and question. Again, in this round, you are allowed to have an opinion. Of course, it's just more beneficial if you also add a question to it so that we understand maybe um, where it's coming from. Next question. Uh, Jan Peter Domlik, uh, track lead of the Track Nature 2.0. Uh, two days ago, I had a date. It was a wonderful day, a wonderful night, and my date would have looked very different if the girl would have said to me, well, I have a business case, you have to pay. The point that I'm trying to make... Yes, continue. I, I really like that she didn't. Uh, 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 the point that I like to make is that we humans can interact as friends. Uh, we can help each other. If you go 100 years back, we were even dependent on each other, so helping each other was normal. Um, you are talking about uh, payment and uh, uh, profit. If, uh, um, in, in most cases, if you would ask people, uh, is it okay for you not to pay, then they will agree. So it's not in the people. And we are now sitting here with people who are building machines and building the ecosystem. So they decide on the narrative. Why? Uh, because I have a feeling that is what you're telling us. Should all those narratives being about people paying? Because most payments are involuntary. Why do you like that so much? Thank you for that question. Next up. Hello, Aaron. Uh, Neil Smith, uh, yes, Delft again. Um, you referred to the fact, which we, I think we all know, that biased data leads to biased results and that the influences are not clear. Um, how do we, or how do you think that we can uh, drive uh, transparency uh, in the data that's used to feed uh, various AI algorithms to ensure that our human values, ethics, and diversity? Uh, are brought uh, into play and that can be reflected back when the algorithms are then applied. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kese. I'm the founder and CEO of Brain Cities Lab in Paris and we are in AI and we work on the question of uh, ethics. We are trying to build a bias-free artificial intelligence. So uh, here is my observation. It's not really a question, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we were talking and we arrived to one conclusion. Basically, um, I think that ethics should not be rewarded with money and cannot be uh, because at the end of the day, uh, with ethics comes trust and trust is the reward of, uh, of the company when it's behaving the right way and it's choosing doing the good for the many. So. Uh, think that, um, I think that's it. And uh, what do you think as a corporate or as a venture? Um, would you make some investment decisions based on the impact, positive impact of a company um, on the community rather than um, on the negative impact? Thank you. This is allowed, stating just an opinion as well. Just making sure that it all adds to the benefit. So while you're listening, also take a moment to think back about the questions you had and to see if you can improve on them and then ask them after the next question. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Michiel. I'm a co-founder at Social Tech. Um, doesn't it come down to the values that we use to interact with each other, and with that I mean the society now interacts mainly with money, which is a huge incentive for corporations. So what if uh, trust, for example, or uh, social value would be uh, our currency, and can we tokenize social, ver uh, social value as a solution to include ethics. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm noticing that so far in this round, only men have asked questions. Just a hint. Yes, come on. No, and, and you're still free to ask it, but just want to make sure that we have a diverse mix. So you're next in line. <laughs> hey, I'm Maya. I'm a developer. And I have a question. First of all, thank you that you mentioned governance. Um, I think it's very important. And you also mentioned how um, close governance uh, is to ethics and um, the power separation. Um, so my question is, do you think um, such a venture can be ethical if it's not uh, political, like it doesn't have a political standpoint? Thank you. Hi, I'm Alex Kael. I work at EDPI, uh, also a team uh, captain in the hackathon. Um, curious as to whether a company, for example, a giant tech company like Google or Facebook, if they uh, were f forced to uh, lose a lot of money because they had to adhere to strict privacy or more ethical principles, and therefore cut tens of thousands of jobs, is that uh, in itself ethical? Good one. Follow-up questions, yes, please, come forward. We haven't seen a line, really, yet, have we? It's a shame. Uh, that's following the Google and Facebook one, actually, is um, when it comes to the staffing and contractor divide that's been going on in the news, how do we reconcile against what I would consider unethical uh, regulation that forces people to be kept out of rooms, et cetera, and then creates a hornet's nest of gossip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my name is Thomas Schijf. I'm an uh, AI software developer, also a team captain. So my question is, um, who in this audience would not um, invest in Uber or Deliveroo? Interesting. Well, let's show of hands. Who would not invest in Uber, Deliveroo? That's a fair percentage. I have my hands full, so not voting. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Aaron, do you have enough to uh, give us some responses? <laughs> okay. Well, then, by all means, take the stage and spend your last seven minutes. Right. Thank you all for your uh, insightful perspectives. Um, on um, on what is ethical? Well, that's the big question. Ultimately, I, I can't answer it, but it's 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 I think very important to flag that what's ethical here might not be ethical there, and what's ethical now might not be ethical tomorrow or at least in a few years. We can, in fact, be pretty sure because what was ethical 100 years ago is not considered ethical today anymore, and we can see clear differences between China or, or Africa or the Netherlands right now. Um, so that, that does pose a challenge, like uh, especially if you want to uh, have a worldwide business, how are you going to be, uh, to be able to, uh, to act ethically um, um, in, in a certain area and not in another? Um, for example, uh, uh, Google now opening up to, to, to China and, and respecting the, the wishes of the Chinese government to do a certain level of censorship, they get a lot of, um, uh, of backlash on that. Um, but, but is it unethical? Is it strictly unethical? Well, it's ethical to, 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 to your mind frame, um, but surely not to, to uh, some people in China who, who, who want that. Maybe not all people in China, I don't know. But, um, uh, so I, I, I don't have the answer. I think it's, um, um, especially if you look at more, more open models and more decentralized models, I think definitely you need a way there to cater for, uh, for different values and, and different regulation, of course, also. Um, uh, I mean, to, again, give the example of Uber, they've been quite notorious in basically just, you know, bulldozing over um, uh, cities and countries in terms of, well, you have uh, regulations, but we really don't care. We have enough money to buy ourselves out of uh, court cases, and we just do what we want. Um, but uh, I think that that's a, a clear 
basically opportunity to, to have a more ethical model where you say, okay, we have a ride-sharing service and we respect um, um, human dignity in terms of wages. Uh, and the wages, are, by the way, are going to be different here and they're going to be different there because the circumstances are different. And we're going to respect the local uh, laws um, uh, and, and, and yeah, ways of, of dealing with, with traffic and with you know, how, how people travel, etc. cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, there's a need for, uh, for decentralized systems and for you know, businesses to, to cater for it. Um, and it will, will stay a challenge. Um, about um, monetizing everything, um, I think that's, that was a very interesting one. And the, uh, the same, uh, the, the, interestingly, there was the, the, the other gentleman as, asking about should we tokenize social value? What I, I would say that's exactly um, paying for a date, right? Ultimately, that becomes, if you tokenize, if you monetize social value, it becomes paying for a date because it becomes, um, yeah, I'll, I'll introduce you to my, uh, my friend, uh, Lee Klee, he's well known in blockchain space, but yeah, 100 euros, please. Or no, one, one Bitcoin, please, is better. Um, that's, um, I think, that, that, I think that's, that's taking the model too far. And I think that's also um, w within this, this um, um, let's say this, this, this spring of incentive systems that we now see with, okay, Bitcoin being the first one of, okay, we have this blockchain is going to mint tokens to, to make people do things. It's an incentive system It has resulted in these huge mining farms. Um, might not be, you know, the, the ultimate uh, desire of the, the original creators. Um, people are now designing more of these incentive systems and it comes from a very um, economic way of thinking. So it, it tends to, uh, people tend to want to monetize everything. And I think in many cases that, um, that goes uh, a bit too far. Um, the, the, the economic part should be the economic part and, and just that. And there is this whole world of, of humans with social capital that is social capital, and it should stay social capital. It should not become um, uh, financial capital because you'll you'll basically destroy it. It, it's, um, it also comes down to if you um, uh, if you ask someone, you give them a, an empty p a piece of paper and, and a pen, and say, "Can you draw something for me?" They'll draw you very something very beautiful. Um, if you say, uh, "I'll give you uh, an empty paper and, and, and a pen." And uh, if you draw something very nice, I'll give you five euros. Um, many uh, uh, many uh, types of, uh, times that has been researched. And the second uh, alternative is going to give you a much worse drawing because people just don't want to be truly creative if they're paid for it, if they're paid for it in that direct manner. I probably uh, misrepresent the, the research, but it's like th that principle, once you start to monetize everything, every interaction, uh, you take away the, the, the un... Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the value, the, the, the things that happen around that you really can't grasp. However, there is a, a core, I think, that you know, is very well um, to, to be uh, monetized. Um, uh, driving transparency in AI. Well, I think there's, there's good work going on in AI explainability because there was the, 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 the bloom of, okay, if we feed AI more data, then we get better results. Feed it more data, we get better results, but then nobody knows what's going on anymore. And now, because you know, these, this is happening, there's becoming a trend of, well, we actually wanna know what this neural network does and why. And I think that can also help in um, determining why is it biased? Because otherwise, you just have this black box, well, we took this data, we don't really know what it is, and it gives us good results in many, many, um, uh, many occasions, but but why does it do that? So AI explainability, I think, can um, can help a lot there. Um, would we make invest at, as outlier? Would we make investment uh, decisions based on positive impact? Well, yes, um, it's definitely a factor that we uh, that we weigh in. Um, as I said before, we haven't yet, and I don't know that we will ever invest in something that's purely, I would say, philanthropic. Then um, philanthropic. Um, but yes, it's definitely a factor that we weigh in in you know, choosing where we invest. Because ultimately, um, when, you, when you build a business yourself, you uh, can you know, create your impact on the world. And by us um, investing in businesses, we also impact, we, we basically, what gets financed in, in the business world, um, it manifests and other things don't manifest. So we, we do realize that you know, what, what, what we invest in or what we don't invest in impacts what, what gets done and what doesn't get done in our little um, corner of the world. Um, now, finally, to, um, to some words to close off. Um, oh, no, just a specific one on job cuts at Google and Facebook. Well, I think if 10,000 jobs uh, at, at Google are cut, 
um, because ultimately it's deemed uh, by, by the majority of people that what they were doing results in something unethical, then I think it's very sad for those people. But ultimately, I think the net result would be uh, positive. But it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard to say at, at, in one go. But I think you'll have to see it. Yeah, you should see it as a, as a holistic thing. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately, you could ask yourself, does, does someone uh, become a very happy and fulfilled uh, data scientist if their, uh, their goal in life is to improve click-through rates by 0.23%? I don't, I don't know about that. It would not fulfill me, for sure. Um, well, uh, finally, to close off, um, I think um, um, one thing to, to, to take away is that um, it's um, to, to touch back upon what I started with, it's easy to point out the bad things. Um, we now see this, well, okay, the bad things, or sort of the bad thing of the moment is surveillance capitalism, to, to basically, you know, simplify it very much. And then the, the counter movement becomes, well, we need more privacy, we need more sovereignty, we need um, privacy by design, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, um, what is the bad side of that counter movement? Because the, um, and, and I think that also touches upon what is ethical now or what is good now and what is, what is good 10 years from now, the things we create today are going to have downsides too. And we're not going to find them out immediately. And you, and you can't, but at least think about it. And um, to, uh, to touch upon the, 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 the first question, uh, what, again, what is, what is ethical? I think when you're at that stage, when you ask that question, and when you ask, well, what's ethical here is not ethical here, and how does that happen, and how does this, I think you're also, you're, you're already quite, you're quite advanced. I think, I think you're good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, I think you're way beyond uh, what, what uh, many others would be. Um, so ultimately, I think the ethical venture is, um, it's a continuous practice. It's not something that you can say, okay, um, I've created it, here it is, and now it's done. Um, it's something that, that plays in your day-to-day um, and that, that goes for open decentralized networks and it goes for more closed, uh, smaller and bigger businesses. And um, I think um, today is a very exciting day. It's an exciting time to, uh, to start a new business. And um, I, uh, I hope that you all will. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to see what you, uh, you all build at uh, Odyssey Hackathon. Thank you, Aaron. So, like before, we had three rounds of listening to a speaker. You had ample opportunity to come up with all sorts of questions and opinions. Gentlemen, gentlemen, count clerks, registrars, um, let me start with you, Ronald. What was um, important for you listening to Aaron and the questions? Poo, uh... Well, first of all, again, it was also clear in the, in, in the questions to Malen. I think uh, ethics is always uh, contextual. It's not, it's not something uh, finite. You always strive towards being more ethical, but not towards finding the answer, being good forever. That's not possible, I think. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the most important messages was indeed, I think, what we think is ethical is different in many countries and cultures. I also wrote down the word manifests, and um, I tend to think that when you're a company or whatever you are, uh, when you write down a manifest, at least you have some kind of, uh, some kind of lead which, which you can share with the world and tell, tell people, like, this is how we want to do it, and if we are th uh, thriving off this path, please tell us, something like that. So, very difficult questions, and uh, I think we should talk about it a lot more. Thank you. Um, Robert, I'm going to interrupt you. How far along are you? Well, it's still a work in progress, um, but I can show a little bit. Um, I think the thing that, that, that really uh, um, uh, stuck with me was the, the question about uh, don't be evil or what is evil. So. I don't know if I can show it. Uh, it says, uh, make sure ethics are reflected. That was one of the first uh, 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 statements that was made. Um, I made this little guy. He sees himself in the mirror. He, he, he says, 
Greed is good, right? And I hope uh, uh, you're all uh, really uh, uh, well versed in popular culture and you will know uh, what I'm uh, aiming at here. So, uh, okay. We're not going to make this a, pop, this a pop quiz, but I'm <laughs> guessing most of you get the reference. But anyways, um, a lot more questions and um, looking at the time, I want to take this opportunity to now have you present references and knowledge. Um, I know I've already asked you for opinions, but now would be the best time to step forward and say, well, you know what, I read this book, it really helped me out. I watched this talk that gave me a lot of clues on how to conduct or made me curious. Whatever it is that you think is eligible to share with this group, please come forward and mention it so that we can record it. Um, and we can share it next week with the entire ecosystem because they're not all here. You're representing them. You're doing the work for them, but you might as well inspire them. So um, I'm going to throw one off. Uh, it's a book called The Starfish and the Spider about centralized versus decentralized systems. A starfish is actually a, a being that you can cut a leg of and it will grow into a new starfish, whereas a spider once you cut the head off, that's it. Any other suggestions? We've had Harari. Please come forward and share your inspirations. Yes. And do form a line. I like lines. My name is Alberto Aguzzi, and I think the tokenization is a really, really powerful uh, uh, blockchain solution. And if you want to grab, uh, grasp uh, uh, an idea of how that works, you could uh, read the Bitcoin standard of Saifuddin Amus. It's a really good uh, historical uh, book which uh, talked about the gold standard and how Bitcoin could be a standard as well. Thank you. Yes, what I found out about talk about ethics, there is a lot to say about it. Um, and I think we're a moment in time that we created this outburst of ethical issues. And the more time uh, moves, moves forward, we will create even more. So it will be extremely complex to, to really understand what, what's happening. And what I found out, there's a lot of commercial talk in the market that's not really hitting the nail for you to understand this topic. And I think one person that I would like to recommend um, that's actually really hitting the nail um, is Jaron Lanier, um, who is, I would say, I, I like the word, you know, um, I, I've also moved out of the privacy movement, and I've, I've been an anarchist, but I've became a practical anarchist. and. I would like to say that like throwing everything out is not is not interesting and Jaron Lanier is for me also the embodied version of a practical anarchist where he's say he's really telling us what's really happening and what it does and how does does that reflect uh, into into who we are. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recommend Alan Watts, The Taboo on Knowing Who You Are, for anybody that's interested in digital identity. It's essentially the same thing. Thank you. We got that right. Okay. Yes? Hi. Press the, uh, the button. Hello. Heichel Davian, co-founder of Cryo. Um, I read an article about um, Idea Road, um, and it says that we are basically tokenizing everything, from cars to houses to cows to fish. Aren't we limiting ourselves um, in adopting the old ways of doing things with the technology that we have now? Because if we look at the bridges that we had, we had in the beginning stone bridges, and then we adopted metal or aluminum. And we started creating the same bridges, the same type of bridges, until we understood the potential of the material. Now we're dealing with new technology. Aren't we limiting ourselves with the power of this technology by just tokenizing everything? Can you repeat the, uh, the, the article, title, or your writer? I don't know the title, but it's, um, you can find it on Medium. Ideo wrote about it. So okay, Ideo, Ideo the design company. Ideo Colab, yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is Abe, I work at Odyssey, and I'd like to recommend this book. It's called Doing Good Better by William McOskill. And it's about something that we've been talking about today as well, about that 
doing good or doing ethic is very uh, contextual basics or uh, based. So, for example, they talk about that some altruistic people designed and gamified um, uh, in a very poor country a well where children could play around with a wooden thing they had to push around and this thing was basically the pump that got clean water up and it worked very well for a couple of years and then five years later they came back and they found out that they actually enslaved children to push around this thing to get clean water up. So it was a good idea but they really had to test it before and talk to the people what they thought like how it could work. It's a great book. Thank you. During last year's uh, health track deep dive, Mark Alfano, a professor from TU Delft, talked about uh, optimization for ethics, seeing uh, our rights and values as attractors in some optimization space that we like as uh, computer scientists, and uh, some repellers, so things that are definitely a no-go. This is very important for building AIs that will understand uh, basically you know, what, what, what things to optimize for. This is the question that we started today with. And uh, Ruth Chang gave an amazing tech, TED talk about making hard choices and why some choices are hard. Um, that's because for some things we cannot really um, we cannot really compare them. It's if, if you choose to eat a donut or an apple for breakfast, that doesn't really matter. One thing makes you healthier, the other thing makes, makes you happier, but they are not directly comparable with each other. And that's so true for many life choices, like which university to go to or what job to start. Those are hard choices because you, you cannot build a very clear metric for how to compare those things. And that's why it's very difficult. Um, for the business side, uh, James Gladfeather, um, doctor from ETH Zurich uh, gave a TED talk called Who Controls the World? Uh, so for those of you who are curious about those conspiracy theories, do check it out, Who Controls the World? James Gladfelder. Um, it's a network analysis, a very data scientific one with a clear conclusion that uh, some corporations controls the, control the world, but um, nobody really controls the corporations anymore. It's, 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 an, it's an emergent property and there is no hidden secret club standing behind it all and pulling the strings. Basically those things got out of control. What do we do about it? Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Thomas Marx. I'm a managing partner of the Ledger. We're a blockchain company in Belgium and the Netherlands. And I have three books for you. They, they all are all quite old, so they are ancient treasures. Uh, one of them is from uh, Eleanor Ostrom, she's a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner in economics. It's called Governing the Commons, and she has like eight uh, different steps and measures you can take on how you can create a successful commons. I think everybody's heard of the tragedy of the commons, but some things in, in, uh, in history really worked in a communization uh, method. So that's a nice one. Uh, the second one I really like because we talked a lot about tokenization, about value, about purchasing powers, etc. Um, one is then, it's, it's, it's one I think it has a lot also to do with ethics. It's called uh, What Has the Government Done to Our Money? It's a really small book from uh, Murray Rothbard. Someone else said they were like an anarchist or a crypto anarchist or an anarcho, anarcho capitalist. The term anarcho-capitalism also comes from Rothbard. It's like a really small book, 80 pages, on uh, how it evolved from a gold standard to a fiat standard and so on. If you have a more taste, man, economy, and states is the biggest, bigger work. Uh, and the third one, because it's, it's, we talked also, I think one of the previous questions or uh, uh, responses were that we shouldn't like uh, monetize uh, ethics, eh? like in the form of a karma coin or something, I think. Sounds quite good. But there's a nice book which is called uh, The Morality of Capitalism. It's by Tom Palmer. And one of the things that's also inside of the book is greed is good. But actually, also in the film, and that's also explained, you don't really say that greed is good. What's, uh, the real quote in the film is greed, for lack of a better word, is good. And that's quite important, is how you measure um, wealth creation and how will you, will, uh, will you monetize and support that and create that. And thank you. Thank you. Final suggestion. Uh, one book I really liked in economics was Freak, Freak, Freakonomics. Uh, it really shows some examples of well-intended uh, legis uh, legislations uh, to prevent crime and stuff like that, which resulted in very uh, other directions. 
it's really easy to read and it has some very fun uh, facts. Another one I really liked in ethics in general was uh, Beyond Good and Evil from Friedrich Nietzsche, which I really enjoyed reading. So. There's a classic for you as well. So um, let's, let's go back to our two speakers. Marlene, would you have a suggestion in terms of a book or a movie or... Uh, well, uh, the good old one, uh, Donut Economics of Kate Rayworth. I think what she describes is that we have to also rethink economics, uh, rethink extractive economy versus generative economy, and where this discussion is about how to deal with the future of the planet and, and redefining growth is, uh, is in need for a, a redefinition of the position of the commons, where Eleanor Ostrom then comes in, like how, then how to govern the commons, uh, where the commons as the planet, but also commons as technology, as, as knowledge, as language, all these narratives come together in, in redefining how to deal with growth and greed and all the other stuff. Yeah. Thank you. She's actually quite often in the Netherlands, I think, doing talks there. Aaron. I, I missed the question, I'm very sorry. <laughs> He's still paying so much attention. Now, would you have a particular book, movie, or talk, for instance, or article that you could uh, share, that you would say that's worthwhile reading? I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment, and it's called The Stack. It's heavy, um, both uh, uh, physically and, in, and, and mentally, but uh, it's, it's very interesting to uh, add, add a lot of perspective around how, you know, how technology interacts with people and becomes a thing of its own or not. And uh, I th yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm early in, but I recommend it. And who's the writer? Benjamin I don't. Britain. Oh, yeah, Benjamin. Benjamin Britten. Okay, thank you. Um, like we said when we started, like I said when we started, this is about calibrating, has been about calibrating your ethical compass. And I warned you in advance that it wouldn't provide you the perfect solution, but maybe it would provide you with one or two handfuls of questions that can help you guide your team through the hackathon and beyond, hopefully, uh, or any other endeavor that you might have. And if I try to listen and understand what has been said just now, one of the things that comes to my mind is um, the art of Aikido, which is a defense, a martial arts. Uh, I used to try it out, <laughs> I'm not that good at it. But one of the most important aspects of it is that there's two of you doing Aikido. One is attacking and the other is defending. Now, if the attacker doesn't actually mean it, there's nothing for the defender to work with and you're not training each other. And one of the things that I take home from today is engage. Do not say it's an us versus them. They will solve it. We're doing our happy thing here. But try and be inclusive. Try and engage and don't walk away for the questions. Actually creating the mess might be the reward in itself because it will force you to come up with questions. So that's what I got from today, but that's just my brain on steroids right now. Um, we'll be sharing all of the notes, obviously, with you next week. Um, but like I said, we're guests at the Dutch Senate. We've been welcomed by one member, and we'll be sent off by another. Can I invite Mr. Alexander Rinoy Kahn for some words of wisdom? Well, for me, this is uh, a very familiar location with a very unfamiliar view. Uh, that would be the one-line summary. And certainly your presence here has dropped the average age in this hall by about 30 years, <laughs> if not more. Uh, and in a sense, uh, it is uh, already a pleasure to be in that kind of company, the kind of insights and interests that you all represent, your ambitions, your emotions, your possibly fears, your concerns, I think they're very welcome inputs to what we also do here on a daily basis. People often refer to this hall as a chambre de réflexion, a chamber of reflection. Let me let you in on a little secret. It doesn't really happen that often. And we are much too busy doing the day-to-day -day 
or week to week in our case, job that we are asked to do and there's really very little time, perhaps too little time left for the kind of reflection that we probably should engage in much more often and much more profoundly. So in that sense, I think you're setting a very good and appropriate example for me and my colleagues when we sit here and to a large extent worry about issues that are related to the concerns that you have voiced this afternoon. Because surely also from where we sit and from what we have to do, it is I think pretty clear that the world is changing at a very rapid rate and that technology changes are behind that. And those technology changes, that technology that is exploding in a way does not explode into a vacuum. It is in a very real sense, as several people have pointed out, a cultural artifact. Technology defines our culture, our culture defines the technology that we can put together and think of. And everything indicates that we are in a period of very rapid and unpredictable transition. And as it concerns you, it also concerns the part-time politicians that we are one day a week. Um, and as we sit and ponder, uh, each of us involved in his own way, I think the one concern that we all have and that you probably will recognize right away is simply the, the question whether or not the rate of change that our democratic systems are able to accomplish can match up with the rate of change that the technology confronts us with. And uh, I'm certainly myself involved in many of the political debates that emanate from the technology change, both here and at the European level. And the very real concern that we all have is that whenever we think we have found a solution, the problem has already changed beyond recognition. And that in and of itself, I think, uh, sets the stage for what I want to, to share with you here. Because the one-line summary, really, of what I am about to say is that we really need help. And we need your help, help from people like you. If you, if you want to think about what the ethical impact of this ongoing industrial revolution is or might be, then it occurred to me, listening to all of you, that it might be useful to look back on the previous big industrial revolution and to figure out what we have learned from that one. And this was a revolution that took place more or less in the time of this particular king. This is, by the way, William II, not William I, as many people think. So around 1850 or so, the industrial revolution started to reach the Netherlands and it had an enormous impact in many, many ways. And the very reason that you call it a revolution is already indicative of what happened, because what revolutions basically do, wherever they occur, they change the distribution of power. And that is what this particular industrial revolution also did. And when you have an industrial revolution of that type, then it creates opportunities for rapid change and as a result it creates newly powerful people and newly powerless people and that is precisely what happened in the 19th century in the late 19th century and society had the challenge to cope with that development and basically I think what we try to accomplish then is to look at the powerful and to make sure that they were properly encouraged and to look at the powerless and to make sure that they were properly protected. And both roles are really crucial because the powerful are powerful because of one very good reason, the change that they represent is possibly a very positive and potentially very rewarding one. So that is the kind of change we want to encourage. We want to make sure that it happens and that it happens rapidly. And at the same time, a civilized society, like the one we want to be, wants to make sure that the powerless, the newly powerless, the people whose life are changed, not for the positive but for the negative, are properly protected and taken along. And of course, what happens everywhere and also here is that both categories organize themselves. The powerful organize themselves, become 
employers employ huge amounts of people, make sure that their interests are well represented and perhaps even more visibly. And luckily, the powerless organized themselves and became the trade unions and made sure that their interests were indeed properly protected going forward. So, if that is a very brief summary of what happened in the previous Industrial Revolution, the question, of course, is how these lessons apply today. Uh, and if you look at the way in which these organizations functioned, it strikes me, looking backward, that, of course, the employers focused on the properly part and made sure that, indeed, they could make the changes and accomplish the progress that they had in mind. And the powerless, the trade unions, are focused on the protection part and made sure that people did not get hurt unnecessarily. Now, capitalism, capitalism that's been around for such a long time, is changing once again. The last speaker coined the phrase surveillance capitalism, that I think is at least the one feature of it, one very nice way to formulate it. The machines that were built in the 19th century were controllable for a long time, but they seem to be somewhat less controllable these days, where we are losing some control over what they could or might accomplish. And as a society, it seems to me that we have a similar role to fulfill and organize, to encourage on one hand and to protect on the other hand. Both roles, I think, are really necessary and both are complex. And if we try to learn from that previous revolution, then um, I would argue that many of the really positive changes that have come about as a result, and that were hard fought and hard won, came as the result of the input and efforts of two subcategories. On one hand, there were the, what I would like to call, enlightened innovators. And on the other hand, there were visionary protectors. And these two roles, I think, are just as necessary today as they were then, about a century ago. Enlightened innovators, employers who realized that to make progress just driving for profit could not be the only role that they had to play, but that they had to carry out that mission in a civilized fashion and take people along, accomplishing those new goals. And visionary protectors who realized that protection was not a short-term struggle, but a long-term battle at the end of the day, leading to a coalition with the enlightened producers that they were initially just fighting. And that kind of coalition, I think, is what we would like to see happen today. And obviously, the enlightened innovators would and should be people like you. That is the role I hope all of you will consider playing. Enlightened innovators who begin by wondering and questioning what the impact of their efforts could be, what uh, gains there could be, and what risks that could be equally and equally crucially. So going forward, what can you do to play that role as you set out to conquer the world, to build your teams, to lead them to victory in whatever struggle you're engaged in? And of course, one of the things that you can do, and I hopefully will do, is to, to read the books that were recommended to you to listen to the TED Talks, uh, to uh, continue your conversations. But there is perhaps something beyond that that I would like to suggest, and that also was part of some of the earlier presentations. And that is to occasionally at least step back from the rush of innovation, from the adrenaline of innovation, as exciting as it is, and ask yourself, at least a few basic questions. The questions like, how will this great product really affect the world that we live in? And whose interests are we really serving when we develop it and take it to the market? And whose interests might be violated 
when we do and if we do under the conditions that we tend to do it in. And how confident can we really be that the power to effect all those interests rests in the right hands? Those questions I would like to suggest are pretty down-to-earth translations of what ethical impact, what ethical efforts would imply in this particular world that we find ourselves in. And to answer those questions, I would also like to suggest that you, listening to, again, some of the speakers, reflect on the kind of co collaboration, the kind of teams, the kind of team composition that you really need. And I would like to suggest that in many situations, the teams that you work with can gain both relevance and quality if you open them to a larger diversity of opinions than is typically found there. Technology is much too important to be left to technologists. There are many, many disciplinary backgrounds that can really help you gather a perspective on what you're about to do and accomplish that can really help you and ultimately help the world in which your ideas will ultimately land. So a diversity of opinions and some basic questions every now and then worth thinking about and answering. Ethics, uh, somebody said at some point, is a conversation, but it's not a conversation about everything. It's a conversation about uncomfortable questions like these. And the more uncomfortable you feel thinking about them, the more necessary <coughs> it is to worry about them. So I hope going forward that you will do as the enlightened innovators did in the 19th century. Organize yourselves. Organize yourselves. Make sure you keep in touch with each other and with your fellow innovators in this hall and outside the hall. And learn from your experience. Be ready to learn from what works and especially from what fails, because inevitably there will be failures next to the great successes that I hope, trust, and wish all of you will be part of. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you took good notes because that was basically the summary. <laughs> Um, thank you again for a wonderful send-off, but we won't be going to the Bites and Drinks just yet, because there's one more person I'd like to talk to as soon as he is available. <laughs> Rutger, can I ask you to come over here? It must have been, um, what, four or five years ago that you initiated the first Bitcoin conference, maybe even six? I lost count. Five. 2014 at the Abbey and Embro office. Okay. And after some time you thought, you know, this is all talk, we need to start doing You initiated the hackathon and now it's becoming this ecosystem. We've had this grand, challenging and inspirational conversation this afternoon. How is the ecosystem going to support the continuation of this conversation? Um, well, I think uh, I, w I always look at what's happening during these uh, meetings and what is clearly uh, doing is what gets this whole movement going. So uh, what you see is that when these in the, the questions build on each other. And I think it's good to continue that conversation online in a focused uh, way uh, and to have some kind of a feedback mechanism for that and also a way of showing uh, what are the most relevant questions at what point in time and so, so these kind of things. So I'm really interested to, to see if we can build on that and also on uh, all the suggestions that, that, that were made. Um, I think uh, the, the list uh, could be uh, much longer, but already you see that people really feel the, uh, the value of, of sharing that material. 
um, because it gets more personal than just doing business. And personal doesn't mean private per se, but it's more closer to the heart. It's what you believe in. So we're actually, I think, rebuilding a new collective belief system and we have to find ways of uh, connecting people to that if they think they can use it. So I would like to find out from everyone how such a thing could be useful in building solutions and also in articulating challenges and defining the problems. Um, there are also, also a few things I wanna, I wanna take away from, from both the, the debates that, that were going on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, you already ran, went back in time a bit when you started about uh, the, the Bitcoin conference. Um, when we go back to uh, uh, the initiation of, of the Bitcoin white paper, and I think it shows that what we maybe perceive as neutral technology, uh, when you read the white paper, the white paper, it's absolutely biased. But I think uh, that is exactly why it's there. Uh, it's a counter reaction towards a, a crisis where there is absolutely no solution to until now, right? It is the alternative. So I think that's, that's an interesting thing. If, if we signal our intentions quite clearly, uh, then, then at, least, at, at least it's a start. Uh, of course, we still don't know uh, what, what will be done uh, with it because, in a sense, it went from a, a biased initiation towards being a ownerless, neutral infrastructure that can be used uh, for good and for, for bad things. And this is part of what I take away from Krein's uh, uh, um, comment that humans are messy and we should not mess with that. Um, uh, it, it's nice to talk about ethics, but we also have to consider when ideology is useful until a certain point where it just conflicts with uh, reality, right? Um, ideology is a tool yeah. for as long as it's useful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really like to the, uh, the, the, the notion of going from a tech space to a cultural space and uh, asking the question of how do we define uh, the world. Um, and when we define the world, how do we look at the world? And in that sense, I have a, a, a recommendation on a, on a film, a movie that is on YouTube by Jan Artus Bertrand. It's called Home. And you see a lot of human processes from the sky. In a bye bye, Marlene. Thank you so of, much. Round, huge round of applause for Marlene. She unfortunately has to go. <laughs> Um, and and, and, and I, I, I thought it was a, a really good help in, in taking a step back and seeing the bigger picture on what we are doing uh, here, literally, uh, on and with the, uh, with the earth. Um, I see a design for tech movement, uh, sorry, uh, a design tech for good movement that is growing. So I, uh, when we look at, at Aaron's uh, story, and also what we've learned on the tech deep dive from uh, Willy Smits is that you can take an NGO towards a profitable model. He has proven that the people, planet, profit model can regenerate rainforests and can bring back thousands of orangutan in that rainforest. It lowers CO2 levels drastically, it lowers the temperature and increases the rain. So that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, so you can start off as an NGO and still gain uh, the insight of how profit can actually help getting your goals in a better way. 
On the other, the other way around can also be done, and there I want to recommend the TED talk of Ray Anderson. He doesn't live, he's, he's, done, he's not alive anymore, but Ray Anderson was the founder and CEO of Interface Global. Uh, it's a carpet factory, basically. It's one of the biggest in the world. And uh, he was shocked when he found out he was actually in a documentary called, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the name, but it is about the destructiveness of businesses on, on Earth. And his company was portrayed as one of the most destructive companies on Earth. And he took that in his heart and said, I'm going to spin this thing around. I want to be from an extractive company, I want to turn into a regenerative company. Wherever Interface Global touches the earth, it becomes better there. He took the whole company around. It's based on their, in their vision, in their mission. And in their mission was also, we want to show the industrial world that uh, within a short amount of time, you can turn your business around and become a restorative business. And he it was really successful in that. Uh, and so he added some of the NGO flavor to, to his... Uh, he became an ethical business, I think. Um, it, it, I learned also that ethics is not a noun. It's a verb. Yeah? So... Uh, hang on, hang on. Ten more seconds. Yeah. So you, <laughs> and, and the result from all that hard work is trust. And much, much more. So, um, let me see, there was... Yeah, we, we, we are growing ecosystems together and trust needs to be embedded in that. So, so um, yeah, I, I think when we look at designing the digital public infrastructure, where we can look as tech just emerging and not being part of it and just implementing it and optimizing. Yeah, that's, that's, we did that with the internet in the Netherlands and we have a high uh, amount of citizens that are on the internet, but what is our influence? We have a second chance at creating the next, let's say, version of the internet. And then the question is, what kind of a place will the Netherlands be for the rest of the world? Could we create together, could we help each other in creating the best place in the world for the best ideas to become a reality and then make them scalable for the rest of the world? No small challenge, but hey, that's why we're at the hackathon, right? Okay, final word. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I hope, because we, do, we did this for the first time, so please uh, give us feedback on how this was for you. If it worked, what worked? If it didn't work, what didn't work? Uh, and I hope you, you will, you will uh, uh, discuss this with your teams, with your colleagues, and uh, I, I hope to see you, of course, uh, next week at the, the, at the Getting Ready. And I, I look uh, forward to, to the hackathon, uh, of course. Uh, but before uh, we get to drinks, I think it's nice. I mean, I'm here for the first time. And with you, everyone here, uh, it would be nice to make a, a group picture, uh, right? <laughs> we have a camera up there. So I would like to, to invite everybody to go o over there, I think. Huh? So. Yeah, that entire half of the room, stand up and join these people. You can sit in their laps, maybe <laughs> hang on their shoulders a bit, not too much. They're relation sheets, not love seats. It is okay to hug, though. It is very much okay to hug. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you don't have to sit, you can also stand. Just make sure that the people behind you are also visible in the picture. Maybe you stand up. Yeah. Oh, all of you stand up. Okay, okay. So, no sitting in laps, just standing up, holding each other. Do our hosts also want to be in the picture? When you, do you want to join us? Please.
Yeah, if you're small, you just move to the front, right? Okay. Are we all in the picture? Say cheese. Let's uh, have a cheer. Thank you. And that wraps it up. Please uh, take whatever stuff you had with you, go to the bites and drinks, discuss, 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 and have a lot of fun. Thank you.